Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Mangus, and it's finally time to review every single character from the Fire Emblem 8 Bachat Picks My Units ROM. The ROM is available, link in the video description. For those of you who don't have Discord, I will include a direct link to a UPS patch. You're gonna have to patch a fresh ROM for yourself, but I will include a tutorial on how to do it if you're not able to. So in this video, I'm going to be reviewing every single character in the Fire Emblem 8 Bachat Pick My Unit ROM. Not just the playable characters, but the bosses too. I'm going to be giving each character a star rating of 1 to 5. For playable characters, 1 pretty much means that you're a trash unit and like you, you can only really be trained as a meme, whereas 5 stars is like really, really good, like a fantastic unit regardless of what you do. And for bosses, I'm going to be rating them 1 to 5 stars depending on how hard I think they are to beat, 1 star being laughably easy and 5 star being incredibly challenging. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's get started with the first playable character. So at first today, we got the main character and the Erica replacement, Cherry. And Cherry is a mercenary, and she starts out with pretty decent bases. She has one skill, and that is Vigilance, which grants her 20% extra avoid. It's not a very good skill, but it does ensure that Cherry is incredibly hard to hit, and she can reach a point in the game where no enemies will be able to hit her at all, which is why the developers started putting special enemies with Sword Slayer in the game just to defeat Cherry. So just be a little bit on the lookout for those guys. They're pretty much the only ones that can hit her in the late game. Her growth rates are decent in most areas. She focuses heavily on speed as well as defense, so she'll be very fast and she'll be very tanky. Uh, but I personally find that her strength is a little lacking. 7 base strength and a 50% strength growth, it can be good, but sometimes I find that she just doesn't grow strength and doesn't deal damage at all. And of course, uh, training Cherry very much depends on whether or not you want to uh, play the Cherry route or the Farton route. If you are going with the Cherry route, then you should definitely train her in the early game. If you're going with the Farton route, she will auto-level, so you don't really need to feed kills to her at all. So this is something you want to be mindful of whenever you start your playthrough. Cherry doesn't have any personal weapons, but she's allowed to use the Rapier, even though this is normally reserved for the Lord class. It's not a great weapon, but it, it, it works. Sacred Stones have triple effectiveness, so I think it, it ends up being pretty useful in many situations. Uh, Cherry, I would rate her three stars. She's a perfectly serviceable unit. She's not fantastic, but she's not terrible either. She's a little uns unspectacular. There's a lot of other units that can do a lot of really cool things, but I think the fact that she is a dodge tank does warrant her some utility. Once she becomes a hero and gains access to hand axes, she becomes a lot better, but she does struggle a lot in the early game. And up next, we have the Seth replacement, Schumanner. And uh, yeah, I'm just gonna get it out of the way right now. Five-star unit. Schumanner is probably the best unit in the game. He's most likely the best unit in the game, bar none. I, I don't think there's any debate about this whatsoever. He has fantastic bases because he replaces Seth. Uh, he has fantastic growth rates because we decided not to have growth rates for pre-promotes in this ROM. Why? Uh, I just felt like it screwed them over a little bit too much long term. So Schumanner, he has a leadership star, so he passively buffs your army by 1% hit and avoid. He has Nihil, which is one of the best skills in this ROM because it pretty much means you are immune to all the BS that the devs throw at you later particularly the monkeys, who are the worst enemies that you'll encounter in this ROM. Nihil will just bypass that completely, which is fantastic. Savage Blowjob, which is which it is aptly named, is also a pretty useful skill for just dealing chip damage to a bunch of enemies around Schumanner. Because he's pretty tanky, he can usually go right into the fray. Camaraderie is decent too, it just heals him a little bit at all times, so usually it just ensures that he stays at full health. And uh, he comes with a Fenrir Tome, which does slow him down a little bit, so be a little bit mindful of this. But he can one-shot a lot of enemies in the early game with this. And he can heal, which is fantastic. But of course, the best utility of Schumanner is his Schumans. He can summon a green Bonewalker Archer. You can't control them, but they still distract the enemies. And they also have a chance of inflicting Berserk on whoever they attack. And they also have Pavais and Aegis. So there's a chance that Schumann will just absorb a hit and not die, which gets better as Schumanner gains experience, because of course the Phantoms will also grow along with the Summoners. Uh, they have growth rates too. I don't know if we can see them, but uh, they, they do have growth rates. And the higher level that Schumanner becomes, the better the Schumann will be too. Eventually, I think at level 15, they have a good chance of getting the, the Devil Ballista, which is just absolutely incredible. So yeah, Schumanner, the best unit in the ROM. I don't think there's any any debate about this. He's just incredible. 
And then we come to the first boss of this ROM, Ninja Mon Monkey. I almost thought it said the first time. Uh, he's the O'Neill replacement and he's not very scary. He has Sword Fair, Steel, Desperation and Charge. So if he charges at you with the Killing Edge, yeah, he might take you off guard with a crit, but this map is so short anyway, it doesn't really matter. Schumanner can one-shot him with a Fenrir. If you place Cherry in the woods, this guy won't really be able to hit her at all. I don't know why he has a Silver Blade and a Poison Sword and a Torch, he's a bit of a joke. I would rate this boss one stars, like, there's nothing tricky about defeating him whatsoever. He's the first boss. Even if he gets a lucky crit on you, it doesn't really matter that much. You can just reset. This map takes like two turns to beat. So not a very difficult boss, all things considered. And up next, we have the Chapter 1 playable unit, starting with the Gilliam replacement, Copelands, the Lance Cavalier. And Copelands has maybe one of the most fun and creative builds in the entire ROM. Uh, his whole gimmick is that he has soul and he wants to proc it to heal himself. He's one of many soul builds in this ROM, but I'd say this is probably one of my favorites. So the idea behind Copelands is that he has soul, which heals him, and he has rightful god, which accelerates the proc rate of uh, soul. So at base, he has a 40... 2% chance to proc it, which is pretty damn good if he wilts his personal weapon. He also has Fury, which grants him a permanent stat boost, but he takes 6 damage after every round of combat. Now, one thing to note about Fury is that if he gets attacked on enemy face, and he kills the enemy in retaliation, Fury does not damage him. However, if he fails to kill his opponent, then Fury will proc. So, if he gets attacked by a lot of two-range enemies, for example, and he's stuck with a lance, then he can very, very easily be whittled down and die. So, it's a risky build. His growth rates are heavily focused on strength, skill, and speed. He doesn't have a lot of luck, defense, resistance, or HP by this ROM standards. Growth rates are pretty high overall. Uh, but he, offensively, he's a powerhouse. But defensively, he leaves a little bit to be desired. Uh, however, because he replaces uh, Gilliam, he has a very good solid con of 10, which means he can use uh, Javelins almost without speed penalty and Iron Lances, and even Steel Lances without taking that much speed penalty. His personal weapon is a Steel Lance, which grants plus 5 skill when held. That, of course, synergizes very well with his soul build. Uh, whenever he holds it, he basically has a 5% ch higher chance of proc soul. Now, I'm going to give Copelands a rating that I think is going to be a little controversial. I think a lot of people will expect me to rate him 4 or even 5 stars. And if I were to rate him just on pure excitement and how fun it is to use him, then I probably would give him 5 stars. However, in terms of utility, I'm going to have to give him 3 stars. Because his build is just too damn risky. Like, if the dice don't roll as they should, and he enters a bunch of combat and his fury starts procking, then he just dies. And you saw this happen on my stream. Like, this is a high-risk, high-reward build. If it works out, it works out really beautifully. However, the moment the RNG gods are not in your favor, he just dies. And for that reason, I can't really rate him that highly, because I think reliability and persistence and, like, just being able to know that a unit will perform as it should perform should be factored into a rating. At the end of the day, Copeland's build is high-risk and so I can't really rate it that highly. But he is very fun to use, like one of the more creative builds in the ROM. Up next, we have the Franz replacement, Hidolfer the Pirate. And Hidolfer is a unit that on paper looks very solid. He is a level one pirate with decent bases for his join time. We even buffed his bases up a little bit because Franz's starting bases are pretty awful. And Hidolfer's whole shtick is that he wants to use heavy weapons. He has Thunderstorm, which grants him 15 hit, 5 crit, and 2 damage whenever he wields a weapon that is heavier than his opposition. And he also has Heavy Strikes, which adds the weapon weight to his crit chance. So that adds up to a lot of extra hit, crit, and damage, which sounds really nice. Uh, in terms of growth rates, he has a buttload of strength and decent skills, skill and speed as well. However, his resistance is really, really bad. He does have a good HP growth, though, so he will get a lot of HP. Um... However, I do have some issues with Hidolfo as a unit, because I just find that his bases aren't really that good, and if you don't train him early on, uh, he can fall off incredibly easily. You saw this happen in both of my routes on my playthroughs. He comes with a personal weapon, the Hedesvelger, which is a Steel Axe with a Brave Effect. It used to be just a very heavy Steel Axe, but the creator wanted to change him. I still don't think this is a very good weapon, if I'm going to be completely honest. The Steel Axe just have garbage hit on it, and Sacred Stone, 65 hit. Hidolfer's going to have difficulties hitting stuff with this, and it also slows him down to the point where he might get doubled. Keep in mind, enemies are stronger in this hack. So, uh, Hidolfer is a difficult unit to use. Of course, you could take him to the tower and grind him up, but you can do that with every unit, so I won't factor that into his rating. Uh, I'm going to give him two stars, I just don't think he's very spectacular. Sure, if you train him up to a Berserker, he will have a boatload of crit, and he will kill a lot of stuff. 
However, the thing is, there are a lot of other units in this ROM that has comparable damage output to Hidolfer, but they also are not made of wet tissue paper and are not super hard to train. And for that reason, that pulls my rating down of, for him quite a bit. But I do recognize that he has potential. Every single unit in this ROM has potential, but I have to rate them based on the average strength of most of the units. The, the truth is, there's just a lot of other units that are better than Hidolfer. Even though on paper, his build looks fine, I find that in practice it doesn't really work out that well. And then we come to the boss of chapter 1, Ashna the Shaman. And Ashna is a very simple boss. She has Wary Fighter, so she can't be double. She has Thunderstorm, which we just went over with Hidolfer. And she has a Luna Tome equipped, which is a very heavy tome. There are heavier weapons you can employ to cancel out the effects of her skill. Like, for example, just use Schumanner with Defender. I think he one-shots or two-shots her. So I wouldn't say this boss is very difficult. Slightly more difficult than the last one. So I'm going to rate her two stars in terms of difficulty. Because there is a chance she can just bonk you with a Luna if you're not careful. But just use Schumanner and kill her and she should die. There, should, there shouldn't really be an issue. Alright, so up next we have the playables of Chapter 2, starting with the Molder replacement, Gormik the Brigand. Uh, Gormik makes a triumphant return into this ROM. He was added later in development, I didn't get to play as him, but uh, looking at Gormik right now, even though I don't have any personal experience with him, I can see that this is a fantastic unit. First of all, look at those base stats. 12 strength, 9 speed. This is fantastic. This allows him to double most enemies for quite a long while, which will allow him to get experience and start snowballing. In terms of growth rates, he has an insane amount of strength and very high speed as well, so he'll be a glass cannon, essentially. Uh, I don't like the 5% rest. That is going to be a little bit tricky in the late game. It's going to make it hard to go up against some enemy mages. Uh, but Gormik will be a very, very solid unit, at least in the early to mid game. Constitution of 16 is very good. allows him to wield, I think, any axe in the game, except for the Devil Axe, without getting slowed down. And Gormik has a lot of different skills. He comes with a single leadership star, which is always nice. That just passively boosts your entire team. And he has Hex and Intimidate. So he essentially removes... Um, 25 avoid to adjacent enemies, and then 10 avoid to enemies two tiles away from him. So this will patch up his low skill and the low hit rate of access. Um, his hit rates will be very solid, actually. I don't know exactly how he'll do against some of the more dodgy sword users. I don't think this will allow him to hit Myrmidons, but it'll help for sure. And not only will it help Gormik, it will also help all of his allies, so he is a fantastic support unit. He also has Gamble, which is a meme. Don't use this, it's terrible. Uh, it will it will reduce your hit rates by a lot more than half, because it reduces your total hit rate, not your displayed hit rate. So, for example, you may think, like, the, oh, the, the, the displayed hit rate is 80%, then you use Gamble, and it goes down to, like, 16% and then you'll go like uh, why is that happening It's because it it halves your total hit rating this is a lot worse than it's advertised a full metal body this is very limited as a skill I wouldn't say it's very good uh, there are there's not that many steel enemies in the game I, it'll it'll come in handy every now and then but not really something that you'll you'll think about um, he has a personal weapon the Gormax it's just an unbreakable steel axe it's pretty bad it, it, it saves you some money in the early game and it ensures that he will always have a weapon available. But uh, as far as personal weapons goes, I'd say it's probably one of the worst ones in the game. But hey, it looks cool, I guess. Uh, I'm gonna rate Gormik three stars. I think he's a very solid support unit. However, I do think that his low res is going to screw him over in the late game. There's a lot of scary magic enemies like the monkeys and I just foresee him just being absolutely torched. His resistance might just stay at zero for the entire game, unless you give him stat boosters, and that is a crippling weakness to have in this ROM. Uh, but aside from that, I think Gormik is a pretty solid unit. Three stars, keep in mind guys, three stars doesn't necessarily mean average, it just means a very solid unit. It means a unit that will serve you well, but it's not a unit that's going to be your absolute MVP right off the bat, no matter what. Gormik has some weaknesses, in particular, his low res is just really bad. Uh, but but I recognize this is a pretty good build. I mean, it helps your allies hit, which is very nice. And then we come to the Vanessa replacement, the thief Yuka, who has an absolutely insane base speed of 17, so she's three points away from capping it. And uh, Yuka is a pretty interesting unit. Uh, she has decent strength growth, also all right speed growth. Her speed growth could have been a lot lower, honestly, considering she starts with 17. And her other growth rates are balanced in most areas. Yuka's entire gimmick is that she crits a lot. She has Death Blow, 
and she has crit boost. So whenever she attacks, she gets basically 35% extra crit, which is pretty ridiculous. Uh, I also put a killing edge on her in post-production because I just realized it suited her better. And uh, I think the creator mistakenly thought that we would use the old assassinate, or sorry, the old lethality. So basically how the old lethality would work is that it would activate based on 50% of your total crit rate. I think the idea behind Yuka was to just have a bunch of crit and proc lethality a lot. The problem in this room is that lethality is based, it procs based on half your skill. It's not based on your crit rate. So this high crit rate build, yeah, it's fun, but it's not as good as you think. Uh, sure, she can kill stuff early on if she attacks, but she's also frail as tissue paper and she has six strength. And in my opinion, it just is really hard to give, get her kills because she's super frail and there's a lot of scary enemies in the room. So I'm gonna rate her two stars. There are better thieves later down the line, which join with much better base stats. And also chest keys in this realm have five uses. I think door keys also have five uses, so you don't really need a thief. There are some good stealables, but there's a character that joins a little later that can steal every item in the game and can also fight. So I find that training Yuka, sure it's fun if you like an assassin that has like 80% chance to crit, but it won't really help you with lethality procs, so it kind of falls flat. I think the, if the creator knew that we would be using another version of lethality, maybe they'd go with another build. Up next, we have the Ross replacement, Sophie. And uh, Sophie is a pupil, not a journeyman. So that means that she can promote to pretty much the entire mage tree. And uh, Sophie is a very interesting unit. Um, obviously, being a pupil, her bases are terrible, but her growth rates are decent. 85% magic is pretty funny. She's pretty much... Uh, guaranteed to cap magic no matter what happens. She's a little frail though. 25% defense, 25% rest. It's a little bit tricky to uh, tank with her unless you give her an A support with her dad, which is pretty easy to do. Uh, she has Lumina, so that allows her to use light magic. And she also has Discipline, so she trains her weapon ranks incredibly quickly. Holy Aura gives her a little bit of a boost whenever she uses that life magic, which is nice. And she's your first unit that can activate Dragon Veins. So for a while in the early game, Sophie is pretty much your go-to activator of Dragon Veins. Of course, most of the Dragon Veins aren't very good, but still, if you like popping them, like, you have to use Sophie, I guess. Uh, she also has a personal weapon, the Dojin Shiki Tome, which uh, is just a solid Shiden Tome with mu much improved stats. Uh, it has perfect weight for her con, it has decent crit, uh, decent might, it's just a very solid tome. Now Sophie, I am going to rate her 4 stars, just due to the insane potential that she has. If you take some time to train her, which is not hard to do at all, since she can chip from 2 range, get her to level 10, promote her, you're gonna have a mage with crazy bases, or a shaman, or a monk, depending on what route you wish to go. And you can also give her a mega fast support with her father Ormond, which pretty much boosts her avoid and allows her to front tank the front lines with no issue at all. Doesn't matter that her defense sucks when no enemy in the game can hit her. She is a little bit reliant on a support to make this work, but even without it, if you promote her early, which you can do incredibly easily, you have a unit that just snowballs and will just murder things. I remember Sophie went absolutely ham in my run. And then we come to the Garcia replacement, Ormond the Tarvos. And Ormond is probably one of my favorite characters in the entire ROM. I'm not saying that just because he's made by my editor, Davis. Uh, I really think this is a fantastically created unit. Like this, this guy utilizes Garcia's strengths and takes them one step further. I've always said that I think Garcia is a very underrated character in Sacred Stones. I feel like he's always overshadowed by Ross, uh, but he has really solid bases for his level, even though his growth rates aren't fantastic. But in this realm, every single character have the same growth rate total, which means that, he, that this unit takes everything that's great about Garcia and then puts good growth rates on top of that, which is even better. I mean, just look at this unit right here. 11 base strength, 9 base speed, that's fantastic. 13 con allows him to wield most axes without that big a penalty. And 11 base defense, I mean, that is crazy. This guy can tank hordes of enemies without issue. Sure, his rest is a little low, so you want to be a little bit careful about mages. That is a weakness he has. But my goodness, this guy can tank physical opponents like none other. And he's also very mobile. He has charge, so he deals more damage the faster he moves. He has a Kanto. Uh, Outrider, so he takes less damage and gains crit when he moves f farther. This is only on the attack, by the way. It doesn't persist through enemy phase. It's only it's only if he moves and then attacks. He gets he takes less damage on the counter and gets more crit. And he has pass, so he can charge through enemy lines and target squishy units in the back. Very very solid. Just Orman just has crazy mobility. And uh, he also has a personal weapon, the Nano Machines, which is a steel axe. 
Uh, sorry, no, it's an Iron Axe with a Nosferatu effect. And this is just fantastic because it means that, oh, Ormond's a little bit injured, just equip the Nano Machines and heal him right back up and then and then swap over to another Axe once he's on full health. So Ormond is very self-sustainable. He doesn't need a healer. He also doesn't need to pop a Vulnerary to heal himself up. He can just attack with the Nano Machines and he'll be able to, to heal himself just fine. If you give Ormond a quick support with Sophie, they become the, the most powerful duo in the game, bar none. Um, I would rate Orman 5 stars were it not for his bad rest. His bad rest puts him down to a 4 star. And the reason why is because if he had good rest, then uh, he would have been able to tank everything. He would have been just an all-around purpose amazing tank. But because his rest is really bad, his rest growth isn't that bad, but his rest base is incredibly bad. Uh, unless you give him barrier staves, pure waters, and talismans, then he's just never really going to be able to tank mages, and every time there are mages on the map, they're just going to tear him a new one. Unless, of course, you give him that quick A support with his daughter, uh, which turns them into a dodge tank duo. But even then, uh, you want to be careful because his luck is really low. So against high crit magic enemies, like sages, for example, or god forbid, dread fighters in the late game, you're going to have a really bad time with Ormond. Uh, also, when you go up against legendary weapons, Ormond is treated as a monster. So against some of the bosses who come with the s rank tomes, for example, they will deal super effective damage against him. Same thing with Bishops and Slayer. They'll just tear him a new one because he is, as I said, treated as a monster. So he has some weaknesses. If it weren't for those weaknesses, I would rate him 5 stars, but those weaknesses pull him down to 4 stars. But my goodness, is this unit fantastic. Together with Sophie, as I said, one of the best duos in the entire ROM, bar none. And then we come to the boss of Chapter 2, the unit that replaces Bone, Rinka the Fighter. Uh, Rinka has a very simple but kind of scary build. She has Counter. However, just be aware that Counter cannot kill you in this run. Uh, it can only bring you down to one health. She has Fire, Blood, and Pursuit, so when she's damaged, she hits a little harder. When she's uh, under attack, she gets a little faster. But this isn't super scary. In terms of difficulty, I'd rate her at 2 stars. Just as long as you keep counter in mind, she's not a very hard boss to, to defeat. Can be a little bit nasty if she comes with another pack of fighters and brigands. So you just want to be a little bit careful about that. But just use Sophie and the Dojin Shikitome to murder Rinka, and you should be fine. So, not a very hard boss at all. Alright, up next we have the playable characters of Chapter 3, starting with the Naimi replacement, Shura. And I'm just going to come out and say it, Shura, 5 stars. Probably one of the best support units in the game, right after Schumanner. I consider Schumanner a little bit better than her, but she's a close second. Shura is going to be an absolute lifesaver for your run. Uh, she's a Troubadour, which means she can heal, which is nice. Uh, her growth rates are okay. She doesn't level her strength or skill, but she doesn't really need to. All she really needs is magic and speed to stay alive. And she has decent HP too, which means she won't often get one shot. Two con is actually pretty nice because it means she has an aid stat of 18, so she can rescue pretty much any unit in the ROM, I think. I think there's a couple units like Grororth in the late game that she can't rescue, but otherwise she can pretty much pick up anyone you want her to. But what makes Shura great are her skills. She has White Pool, which is a fantastic support skill, gives five damage and five attack speed to adjacent allies. Not five speed. It doesn't boost, like, their avoid, but it just increases their likelihood of doubling or avoiding being doubled themselves. And on top of that, she also has spur defense, which stacks and also makes them take four less physical damage. So you just stick Shura in the middle of whatever you're fighting, and she will just help your allies double, she'll help them deal more damage, and she'll also make them take less damage. I mean, the amount of extra bonus offense you get out of White Pool is just ridiculous. Say you would normally deal 10 damage once, and then you put Shura next to a unit, suddenly now you're dealing 15 damage twice. So you just gain, you just tripled your damage output from White Pool in certain scenarios. I mean, it's just crazy. The combination of five extra speed and five extra damage often means that you'll be able to one run whatever you put Shura next to, which is fantastic. And hey, being able to reduce the amount of damage taken by your allies is also fantastic. She doesn't have a personal weapon, despite being a Patreon unit, or despite being a Patron, but we gave her the Barrier Staff at base, uh, which is pretty nice. So, yeah, fantastic unit, 5 out of 5 stars. I would say if, Sh if Schumanner wasn't in the ROM, I'd say she was probably one of the best ones. And then we come to the Colm replacement, Sam the Myrmidon. Sam has pretty bonkers bases for a level 2 unit. 14 skill, 15 luck, and 10 speed. I don't really know how this happened. I guess Colm just has good personal bases, but weak class bases in the Thief? I'm not entirely sure why. 
And uh, Sam has an absolute boatload of luck. 100% luck growth, which is pretty crazy. However, his skills leave a little bit to be desired, for at least for me. Perfectionists, it's decent, but I hate how when you level up and gain a hit points, which Sam... Uh, actually, no, he has the 30% HP growth, which is kind of bad when you think about it. But when you level up HP, you lose the benefit of Perfectionist, which is really annoying. Uh, his Patience, which is nice for dodging, and Arm Strift, which seems good on paper, but I, I don't really think that you struggle that much with money in this ROM. So, sure, it's nice to not expend your Killing Edge, but I wouldn't say it's, like, fantastic or anything. Especially considering, you know, it's only luck percent, not luck times two or times three, which is is in some of the other games. But uh, yeah, Sam is a he's a fun unit, but I don't think he's very good. I'd rate him two stars. Uh, he, he certainly can work. He can become quite a bit of a dodge tank. You train him up to an assassin, for example, he's gonna cap luck and speed and be nigh on unhittable with patience. But he's still sword locked, which isn't fantastic. There are definitely better units in this ROM. But he's decent. And then we have the very first Patreon unit, Amon. He doesn't replace any unit in particular, we just added him on top of the ROM. And uh, he has bases that should be comparable for a unit of this joining time. Although, they are perhaps a little bit lower than some of the other units around this chapter. Amon is a lord, and his entire gimmick is that he's insanely good on enemy face. He has bracing stance, so he takes less damage on enemy face, and he also has fear stance, so he deals more damage on enemy face, and also he comes with voice of peace, which just passively reduces the damage done by all enemies around him, so he supports his allies a little bit too. A Amon's bases are not fantastic for his join time. Uh, he has 8 strength and 10 speed, which is good enough to double, but he doesn't do a lot of damage. His growth rates are balanced in most areas, being around 50%. His weakest growth rate by far is his persistence, and he, his HP is also a little low for a physical class. Most other units in this ROM usually have 70+. plus. But uh, he also has a personal weapon in the Echo, which is just an Iron Lance with a Brave effect. This is okay, but I often find that his low strength means that he just wastes a bunch of durability and doesn't even kill his target. The thing about Amon is that he has super good potential. If you train him up and get some good stats on him, he can tank like entire armies on his own, thanks to his skills. Like, the combination of Bracing Stance and Fear Stance just means that he becomes an enemy face monster. You put a Javelin on him, he can just clear out entire packs of enemies. So I'm gonna rate him four stars just because of that. Because he has insane potential. One of the best, like, frontline tank units you will get in the ROM. He also supports with a bunch of really good units. I think he has a good support with Ormond, if I remember correctly. So have Amon and Ormond tank together on the front lines, and you have a incredibly powerful duo. Then it's time to review the boss of Chapter 3, Bloom. And Bloom is a mage, and he's all about inflicting status on the oppo opposition. He has the Petrify skill, which is incredibly scary, has a skill percent chance of turning you to stone. He also has Enrage, so he can also berserk your units if you're unlucky. Rightful Lord, which gives him 10% extra chance to proc those skills. And on top of that, he has Wind Disciple, so whenever you injure him, he gets a slight boost to his hit and avoid. He also moves off his throne, so be careful. He will move off to attack you, will hit you through the wall, uh, so just don't pull him until you're ready to deal with him. In terms of pure difficulty, I would say that Belome is a 4-star unit. Uh, he's incredibly nasty because at this point you don't have a restore staff. You don't have any way to cure his status. If you're lucky, he'll just hit you with the Petrify and stone your unit. If you're unlucky, he'll berserk your unit, which can very easily lead to a kill. And because he's a mage, it's kind of hard to get the jump on him. You can move Schumanner in and try to kill him, but more likely he's just going to move off his throne and hit one of your units. And at this point, you just aren't really ready to deal with that. So for that reason, I rate him pretty highly. He's definitely one of the more challenging bosses of the early game. For some players, I imagine they'll just go in and one-shot him and call it a day. But if you're a little bit unlucky, he can proc a skill and and uh, turn your run into a failed one. So, a very scary boss. Up next is the Arthur replacement Lanta the Archer. Now, we realized very quickly that the combination of Lethality and Rightful God was way too broken, and so we increased the cost of, I think, either Lethality or Rightful God, I don't remember which one, but we increased the price of them so that you couldn't get these two in combination anymore. You can get Lethality and Rightful Lord, but not this combo. However, Lanta's creator was able to do this uh, before we nerfed it, and so we let her keep it. This results in an archer that pretty much deletes anything she goes up against. Not only that, but I mean, just look at her stats. I don't know what happened here. 10 strength, 12 speed? 
I, was Arthur always this good? Like, this doesn't really make sense to me. I think we may have buffed Archer base. That's not entirely sure how this occurred, but she's just ridiculous. 10 strength, 12 speed. That means she's going to double most enemies she goes up against. And she also has fantastic offensive growth rates. Uh, very low defense and rest, though. And uh, her defense and rest base is also very low. So she's a squishy unit. Very liable to die. But just due to the fact that she has a, I mean, what... 45% chance, actually no, it's more like 37% at base, I think, to just proc Lethality and kill whatever she goes up against is incredibly good. I mean, once you get her to a Sniper or a Ranger or whatever you want to promote her into, you have a unit that can just consistently delete bosses. And for that, I have to give her a 4-star rating. This unit is simply too damn broken. If she was like a mage or another unit with reliable 1-2 range, she would probably be one of the best, like, pure combat units in the ROM. But thank god she's just an archer. But man, what an archer she is though. A really, really strong unit. If she dies, there is a funny dragon event later on in the cherry route which can revive her into a revenant. It isn't very good, but it's kind of funny. And something to keep in mind should you happen to lose her. Then we come to the loot replacement, Hiccup, who now has an appropriate portrait. I can't believe I didn't realize this was a How to Tame Your Dragon reference when he first popped into the ROM, but now I definitely see what the creator went for here. Hiccup is an incredibly strong Vyvern Rider, and I mean strong in the literal sense, because he comes with a base strength of 15, which is just ridiculous. His growth rates are pretty low in terms of strength, but he doesn't need more than 35% because he's pretty likely to cap his strength regardless. So the creator was very smart with how they distributed Hiccup's growth rates here. Uh, he has high growth rates in the stat that he needs, which is skill and speed, which is which are his like two lowest bases aside from his rest. Uh, so that is really well distributed growth rates. I always like to see when people take their bases into account and adjust their growth rates accordingly so they don't end up wasting them, which is very smart. Tenkon is solid, it means he can use most lances without taking a speed penalty. And he also comes with Nullify, which protects him from archers, which is fantastic. You never have to worry about any archers shooting this guy down. I mean, his base defense of 10 is pretty solid too, so he should be able to tank arrows decently well. He also has pass, so that really amps up his mobility, allows him to uh, fly through enemy units and kill units in the back. Just an overall really solid unit. It comes with a Snoggle Tog personal lance. This is a steel lance with improved stats, which perfectly lines up the weight with his con, so he can use this without taking any speed penalty at all. I think this is a slightly better silver lance in terms of pure stats. So this is a fantastic unit. Four out of five stars. Uh, just solid combat unit altogether. Will be able to kill most units he goes up against. And yeah, just really solid unit. And then it's time to review the boss of Chapter 4, Wausowski the Cyclops, or as I like to call him, Groroth at home. Uh, Wausowski looks scary, but he's not that scary. He has uh, the skill Killing Machine, which doubles his total critical rate, which is scary when he uses a Killer Axe. The problem is, the AI really likes to equip Hand Axes on Attack at 2 range, so as long as you can dupe him into using his Hand Axe, uh, the crit rates won't really matter, because he has 9 skill, which is what, like 3.5% crit rate at base, and his tree lock. So he's like 4 to 5% crit, and the hand axe doesn't have any crit on it, so this just doesn't end up mattering at all. Just make him use the hand axe. If he just had the killer axe, he'd actually be a scarier boss, I think. Uh, he has a Hoplon Guard, which you can steal, and you definitely should. Uh, there are many characters in this ROM who really benefits from this, so don't let it go to waste. Steal the elixir too, if you can. Uh, in terms of like boss difficulty, I'd say he's two stars. Not very scary. There is like a chance that he might come in and crit you with a killer axe if you're not careful, but he's a very easy boss to play around. I mean, he's kind of tanky, very strong, but overall not a very scary boss at all. Just dupe him in, dupe him into equipping a hand axe, make him attack at two range, and then surround him and kill him. Pretty, pretty simple. All right, up next is chapter five, and it's time to take a look at the Vanessa replacement, NX, the soldier. And NX is one of my favorite units in the ROM. I really enjoyed using him for multiple reasons. First one being a, he has insane bases for a level one soldier. I mean, just look at this, 10 skill and 13 speed at level one. This guy has 19 levels to grow, which is fantastic. His growth rates are really good too. Like 50 in most areas, 25 rest, 75 HP. Solid, it works, doesn't need 
need to be any more fancy than that. Two leadership stars, nice little boost to your entire army just from fielding him, and he comes with two very nice debuffing skills, Daunt, which reduces hit and crits, and Anathema, which reduces avoid and dodge. So he reduces all four primary stats from enemies around him, which means that having NX in the fray of the fighting will benefit your entire army, which is just fantastic. I mean, both of them are tree tiles. So this is this has a huge area of effect. It's very easy to gain benefit from. Just make sure you always move NX first, move him into the fray, and try to have him be within tree tiles of as many enemies as possible. And you'll find that his skills will help you in like four to five, maybe six to seven different encounters every single phase, which is absolutely bonkers. Blue Flame, I think there are a couple other Blue Flame units in the ROM. I never use this, I don't really consider it a big deal, but hey, it's too extra damage when you want it, I guess. Uh, I'm gonna rate NX 4 stars, just an incredibly solid support unit, fantastic unit to have. Being a soldier, he'll level faster because his internal power level is lower, because soldiers are treated as a weaker class, uh, and as a result, he'll gain experience super fast. So just, yeah, he's, he's a fantastic unit, absolutely magnificent unit. His one weakness is that his rest blows. One base rest, 25% rest growth. He will struggle against mages, and there are a lot of scary mages in this ROM, in particular the monkeys, which will tear him a new one. So make sure you have a pure water or a barrier staff user following him around at any time, and also support him up with someone to increase his avoid, because he will need it, but overall, a really solid unit. Up next, we have the Joshua replacement, Jackoff the Mage. Uh, he is a Blossom unit, which means I hate him. One star. I, ju I just don't like Blossom units. Sure, his growth rates are incredible. 88% in every stat. If you train him, then you'll probably cap every single stat. I mean, despite the fact that he has a base strength of one, that is. Sure, sure, he'll cap every stat. But he's boring, and it takes him forever to train him up because... Blossom halves your experience gain, which means he'll he'll level up so incredibly slowly. Discipline plus, sure, he can train his weapon ranks, okay. I just think this unit is boring. Maybe it's mean for me to rate him one star, but I just, I hate Blossom. I think it's a boring skill. I regret that we put it in the pool, because it just means that the unit will just be incredibly boring to use. He doesn't do anything special, he doesn't buff, he doesn't debuff, he doesn't have any fun skills. He's just a bowl of stats, but he doesn't even start that good. I can see why someone would want to train him. It's fun to have a unit that caps every single stat in the late game, and I'm, I'm sure he can tear all kinds of of uh, ass, but <laughs> tear all kinds of ass. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, no, I don't like Jackoff. I mean, this, this rating is a little biased, but I don't like him. And then it's time to review the boss of Chapter 5, Gas. And uh, Gas is a simple but very effective boss. He has Nihil, which isn't really that big a deal at this point during the game. You don't really have that many scary skills that can affect him at this point. Like, it, it'll cancel out your debuffers and whatnot, but, I mean, it won't do things like cancel out Sh- I'm not actually sure if it cancels out Shura's White Pool. I would think that it might, but I'm not entirely sure. Maybe someone can confirm this in the, in the uh, comment section. But uh, Gas is a pretty scary boss. He has a Shamshir and a Light Brand, so he can attack from one entry range. Uh, but what I think is the most scary about Gas is the fact that he has eight leadership stars. So he buffs all enemies globally on this map with 8% hit and avoid, which makes this map a lot harder than it should be. So in terms of pure difficulty, I rate him three stars. Gas himself is not that scary, and Nihil isn't really that big of a deal this early on in the game, but his stats are pretty scary, and he buffs all of his allies. So for that reason alone, he's a pretty scary boss. Up next, we have the Ephraim replacement, Farton the Sword Knight. However, uh, because I forgot to remove his Lance rank when I created the character, and chat begged me to keep it in, he's now a Sword slash Lance Knight, which makes him a lot better than he otherwise would have been, so I guess this is a good thing. Uh, Farton was clearly made to be a bit of a joke. He's clearly a reference to Arden from FE4. Uh, he has Celerity, so he's a little bit faster than your average Armor Knight. And he also has Nature Rush. I don't actually know what constitutes rough terrain. I would think forests and mountains primarily. I don't know if any other terrains would constitute. I almost never took advantage of this, but um, that's just because I kind of forgot he had it. But you should definitely take care to always leave Farton in a forest tile or a mountain tile whenever you can. Actually, can he even walk on mountain tiles being a sword knight? I don't think he can, so I guess this would this only counts for forest tiles. Unless there's some other rough terrain in the game I'm not thinking about. So if you do that, he will consistently enjoy plus two move, which is kind of nice. Um, so Farton, he's a unit that I thought was completely garbage at first, but I actually was 
pleasantly surprised by how decent he was. He's not like a great unit or anything, but he's not as trash as I thought. Uh, he has good growth rates, 70% strength, 40% uh, skill, 45% speed is alright. Uh, he doesn't have many trash growth rates, his rest is definitely his weakest point, and he is pretty weak to mages. Uh, however, I still rate Farting Tree Stars. I think he's actually a pretty serviceable unit. One of the reasons is he has the Regan Leaf in sword form, which is the Pursuit Sword. And the Regan Leaf is still pretty damn amazing, even as a sword. Uh, especially when it goes up against like Great Knights with Axes. He's really strong there, or just like Axe Armor Knights or Axe Generals. He can usually just one-shot them with the sword, which is fantastic. But, uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, I thought Farton would be completely useless, but the truth is that is, if you give him some experience, he actually fights pretty damn well. And he becomes pretty damn tanky, too. 12 base defense and 50% defense growth means that he will tank a lot of enemies. And because he can wield javelins at base, this means that he actually has an enemy face, unlike most sword knights. So, yeah, not as bad a unit as I originally thought he would be. Uh, you can also promote to an ambulance, which gives him staff access, and that turns him into a fantastic support unit. So, I wouldn't say he's, like, great or anything, but he's certainly not as trash as I thought he was at first. And I do believe Honomud, and this is Honomud's character, I think he created him intentionally to suck. So, I guess you failed at that. And then we come to the Kyle replacement, Robin the Axe Lord. Definitely one of the more popular units in my run. The chat really loved Robin. I think they just really enjoyed her design and the fact that she was a female axe armored lord, which just made her look really kick ass. She even has unique animations in the game. Uh, Robin is an incredible unit. I mean, just look at those stats right off the bat 14 strength, 8 speed, that's bonkers. 12 defense. She's as tanky as Farton. 14 con is ridiculous, allows her to use steel axes without being weighed down, which is fantastic. 4 leadership stars too, very useful. That's 4% hit and avoid to your entire army. That's incredibly useful. Uh, Voice of Peace, also another fantastic support skill. Not only helps Robin, but uh, allies close to Robin as well. Expertise, this this never comes into play. Uh, if, she cr if she gets crit, she dies. It doesn't matter, because her HP is really low. And Blue Flame, yeah. Pair together with NX, they can do some decent damage together. I wouldn't say Robin's skills uh, is why she's good, it's primarily her stats. Just 14 strength and 12 defense is one of the reasons why she's fantastic. Uh, however, I will not rate Robin higher than 4 stars. I think she's a very solid combat unit, but what prevents her from being 5 stars is the fact that her HP absolutely blows. 30% HP growth, uh, unless you give her an Angelic Robe, she's gonna stay on 20 HP way into the late game. And with really bad rests, even though she has a decent rest growth, uh, she's going to get absolutely murdered by mages, so you need to keep her far away from those. Or at the very least ensure that she has pure water and barrier staffs available. But, pu like, pure combat-wise, Robin will tear through the enemies that you go up against. And she'll do a lot of damage, and she'll consistently double as well due to not being slowed down due to her high constitution. And with her passive leadership, she'll just boost your entire army. So, yeah, one of the better units in the ROM. Very close to a 5-star, but doesn't quite reach there, because I set the bar for 5-star units very high in this ROM. Then we have the Ford replacement, Moria, or Moriah, whatever you want to call her. And uh, Moria is a monk. And uh, Moria has Aptitude, which is an S-tier skill, which means it's the only skill that she gets. So she too is a growth unit, but unlike Jackoff, she doesn't gain half experience. And her growth rates are comparable to Jackoff. So she's just a much better growth unit. Uh, just look at her growth rates. I mean, she has 50% strength, 75% magic, 60% skills, 65% speed, 45% luck, 80% defense. I mean, she's so tanky. She'll level defense every single level. She, Once she becomes a bishop, she will tank everything. She's an overall very solid tank. Fantastic bishop candidate. Uh, Khan is a little low, so she does lose a little bit of speed from some of the heavier light tomes, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Once you get uh, Mariah a couple levels, she, er, she will her survivability will just increase to the point where she'll just tank absolutely everything. And I used her to great effect. She's another easy 4-star unit. Uh, doesn't quite reach 5-star tier because, again, I set the bar very high. But um, starts out strong, levels up very strong. Once she becomes a bishop, she gets the slayer skill and she tanks everything. So just a really, really solid unit. One thing which I forgot to mention about Mariah, which I'm editing in in post-production, is her personal weapon, the Weissender. I don't know how to pronounce this. Uh, it is a Shine Tome that gives her the Boon skill. So whenever it's held as her number one item, it will cure her of bad status effects. 
this can be highly useful on certain maps with status staves. Just put Mariah in their range, have the Wysander equipped, and she will just immediately cure herself after being silenced, sleep, or berserked. Uh, also works on poison for whatever good that does, or the petrify effect. So there are a number of maps where this tome will be an absolute lifesaver. I tended to forget a lot about it, but you, as long as you keep it in mind, you can absolutely cheese certain maps. Then we have the Orson replacement, Claire, and I'm not gonna rate Claire right now, I'm gonna rate her later on, because she does, in fact, rejoin you in Chapter 16. Uh, but she, once she does, she will gain a bunch of auto levels. I'm not really sure if giving her any experience in this chapter actually helps, but uh, I'll come back to her later on in the video. Then it's time to review the Chapter 5X boss, Risto. He used to be a mannequin, but then we got some bug reports that his animations was doing all kind of glitchy things to the ROM. And rather than taking my time and actually figuring out what why this happened, I just decided to turn him into a Revenant for lulz. So he's a one-star challenge boss now. Doesn't matter that he has Petrify, doesn't matter that he has Savage Blowjob, Glacius, it doesn't matter. Just, just kill him. He's a Revenant. He will move off his throne, so be careful about that. But, um, you shouldn't have any issues with him. All right, and up next, we come to the playable character of Chapter 6. And in Vanilla FE8, you don't get any characters in this chapter, so we added our second Patreon unit, Sev. And Sev is an absolutely fantastic unit. He doesn't replace anyone in particular. He's a brand new unit added, and a lot of people said that he should have been the main character of this Rob instead of Cherry. I do agree. He has much more of a main character vibe going on. I mean, just look at his portrait. So Sev is a mercenary, same class as Cherry. And he comes with pretty respectable bases for his joint time, 9 strength, 13 speed, that's pretty good. He has really low luck. I don't really know how we decided on his stats. DS Noon made this unit. I think he just put in some generic stats appropriate for a level 8 character. I don't know why Sev ended up having 2 luck, but that is like one of his biggest weaknesses. He really needs a Hoplon guard. Uh, Sev comes with Aether, which is a fantastic skill. Whenever it procs, which isn't very often, it will kill whatever he goes up against and often heal him to full health to Booch. And it does have skill divided by two, so its proc rate is very low, but he does come with Rightful Lord to, to uh, offset this. So it'll proc a little bit more than you might expect. At base, I think he has a 18% yeah, chance to proc it, and this will just increase as he levels up. He's very likely to cap his skill. Uh, he starts out with very decent skill and a 50% skill growth, so he'll definitely reach it. And most of his other growth rates are fairly solid as well. His luck growth is a little low, and again, combined with his base 2 luck, he really does need a Hoplon Guard. But you can get multiple Hoplon Guards in this game, so this isn't a big deal. Uh, Sev also has Dragon Blood, so he's your second unit you get that can activate Dragon Veins. Dragon Veins, you can debate how useful they are in this ROM. Most of them are kind of trolly, so I don't really consider this like a good thing, but hey, they're there if you want to activate them, I guess. Uh, Sev also comes with his personal weapon, the Galantine. This is a fantastic weapon. I believe it's an Iron Blade with extra stats. And this really works well for him. I mean, just look at this. 90 hit, 11 might, and 9 weight. It doesn't slow him down. Uh, it's fantastic damage. 45 durability is really strong as well. So uh, I would say this is probably one of the better personal weapons you get in the early game. Fantastic, fantastic weapon. Once Sev promotes to hero and gain access to hand axes, he will clear out entire enemy squads. He'll become really solid. I rate him 4 out of 5 stars. Uh, one of the better units in the ROM overall, and a perfect candidate to give some experience. And then it's time to review the boss of Chapter 6, Dushkas. Uh, he's an armor knight with fairly strong bases, uh, very high defense. You definitely need either magic or some effective weaponry to take this guy down. Three leadership stars means he buffs most enemies on this map. He has renewal, which isn't really that big a deal. Uh, usually you kill bosses in one turn when you start focusing them. And he also has grisly wounds, so whoever you attack him with will take some damage. So I rate him three stars. He's not super scary, but he's also not weak. Uh, he can take you a little bit off guard if you don't know how to deal with him. But overall, he should melt fairly quickly. Uh, it comes with a short spare and a killer line, so you do want to be a little bit cautious. You, you definitely want to just uh, burn him down very quickly with some magic units and some effective weaponry. Uh, he does have two elixirs, which he will drink, so bring a thief over and steal them if you want. Uh, can be kind of nice. And then it's time to review the playable unit of Chapter 7. This is another Vanilla Sacred Stone chapter where you don't get any new characters, so we added our third patron unit, Sub, the Bocab. He's a Bocab. He is extremely fast. He has celerity, so he has nine move at base, which is pretty funny. Uh, he has Wind Disciple. I didn't really 
really use this all that much. I mean, it's nice, I guess. You know, if you have him run around a little injured, he gets a little bit of extra hit point and, and dodge, but it's not really that big a deal. And he's also your third unit that can proc Dragon Veins, whatever, for whatever good that does you. Uh, 9 Strength, 13 Speed is pretty nice. He'll double most enemies in this joining chapter. And his growth rates are very balanced in all areas, around 50% in every single stat. Uh, con is decent too. 9 Con means that he can still rescue a lot of units with 6 to 8. It also means he can wield most bows without losing speed. So, decent blend and mix of stats and, and growth rates here. Very, very passable unit. Also comes with a personal weapon, the Mariner. This is a Steel Bow that that has 1 to 2 range, so he can do a little bit of frontline tanking with this bow. A very situationally useful bow, whenever you whenever you have Subby be in range of a couple of enemies, I would very often just trade him the Mariner so that they wouldn't go for him and he would not he would be able to counterattack them, so that's kind of nice. Uh, yeah, this is an alright unit. I, I didn't find Subby to be like insanely good, but he's okay. 3 out of 5 stars. Uh, he becomes insanely much better in the late game if you promote him to the Sagittari, which is a bow knight that gets Kanto plus. Uh, he really utilizes that movement fantastically. He gets like 10 move, I believe, and then he gets 10 move with Kanto plus, so he can shoot and then he can retreat out of enemy range. At that point, he, he becomes really solid, but it is a little bit hard to train him in this realm, I find, because enemies scale pretty quickly compared to vanilla Sacred Stones, so if you don't give him enough experience, he can fall off very quickly. That happened to me in the Farton route. In the Cherry route, he became my absolute MVP. But in the Farton route, he fell off very fast. So, yeah, he's a very solid unit. He has a lot of in-game potential. But there are other units in the ROM that are better than him, in, in my honest, humble opinion. And then it's time to review the boss of Chapter 7, Amaya. He's an archer, and he comes with one skill, point blank, so he is able to defend himself at one range, so be a little bit cautious about that. He also has four leadership stars, so he buffs the enemies on this map by quite a bit. He has a longbow, a killer bow, hoplon guard, and elixir. Definitely want to steal the hoplon guard. Uh, because he has a longbow, it's it's a fairly simple to deal with him. You definitely don't want him to use the killer bow, so don't pull him at two range. Uh, that's going to make him very hard to defeat, unless you have hoplon guards yourself to counteract this crit. It's fairly simple to kill him. Just put a unit here so that he moves off his throne, uses his killer bow, and then you can just surround him with units. And because he ha now has the longbow equipped, uh, he loses three points of speed and he's very easy to deal with. So for that reason, I'm going to give him a two-star rating. He's not particularly challenging at all. The only thing that can be a little bit scary is if you forget that he has a killer bow and he just moves off and bonks one of your units. So he can be a little bit scary like that, but overall, one of the easier bosses in the game. Up next, we come to the playable characters of Chapter 8, and this is once again another chapter where Sacred Stones doesn't give you any units, so we have two Patreon units joining in this one, the first one being Unil the Mage. And Unil has a very, very simple concept. She has Ignis, which adds 50% of her defense and rest uh, whenever it procs, based on skill, and she has Rightful God, so she gets a 30% bonus to that proc rate. So, at base, she has a 44% chance to proc it, which is very, very often. Uh, the only problem is it doesn't deal that much damage at base. It, it, it only deals 5 extra damage whenever it procs, so you'll barely notice it. Um, and she does have decent growth rates, although I personally would have uh, put some points in magic and skill over on defense and rest. Because if you're going to run an Ignis build, you definitely want to make sure that you cap both defense and resistance in the late game. So I think personally putting 65 and 75 in magic and skill respectively was a little bit of a mistake. There are much better ways you could have distributed growth rates uh, to really make an optimal Ignis build. So for that reason alone, I don't think Unil is super good. I rate her 3 out of 5 stars. Uh, I definitely see her potential once she gets rolling, because you know the the dream is to have a late game sage with that prox Ignis like on basically half of her attacks and just deals a crap ton of damage. But to me, I felt like the creator could have put more points into defense and rest to make this even more viable. Because if you can cap out your defense and rest, then Ignis becomes very very strong. You don't really need that much magic, honestly. I, although I, I understand what the creator was going for here, they definitely wanted to make like a high damage build, which is nice, but I found that, that Unil needed a lot of help to get going, and uh, it, it, she just snowballs a little bit too slowly for my liking, but you can always send her into the tower and murder a few kids and, and go ham like that. Uh, she also comes with a personal tome, the Ember, which is the fire tome with improved stats. It's good, it weighs one, so she doesn't get slowed down by it, which is nice. Seven might is okay, very good hit rate, so it's good against dodgy enemies. Uh, Unil is a serviceable unit, but she's not fantastic. I feel like her build could have been executed better. And then it's time for the second Patreon unit, HALAKO! That's how you say it. You have to, you have to yell it, because it's written in all caps. And Hanako 
I'm gonna rate her something which I think a lot of people will find very controversial. I'm gonna rate her five stars. She is easily one of the best utility units in the ROM. Why? Because she's the only unit in the game that comes with Steel Plus. This allows her to steal everything, as long as her con is higher than the weight of whatever she's stealing. Although, she can't steal the primary weapon held by the enemies. She can only steal secondary weapons. But there are a lot of good items you can pick up with this skill. And because Hanako has 18 con, I don't think there's a single weapon in the game that she cannot steal. I mean, she can even steal Devil Axes, I think. At least when she promotes the Marauder and gets like 19 or 20 con, she'll get even better. So, uh, I mean, her stats are decent, 9 strength, 12 speed, uh, she has decent growth risk, 69 strength and speed, so she'll cap strength and speed very easily. She, she will need a little bit of help sometimes to steal against faster enemies. I definitely recommend giving her speed wings, that will allow her to steal from fast units like thieves uh, eventually once, she, once her speed gets going. Little low luck, so she, she likes the Hoplon guard, so definitely want to keep that in mind. And she also comes with a uh, personal weapon, the Juggernauts which is a Steel Axe with improved stats. I think sh she used to have, I think the old version of it gave plus five speed, but then we came to the conclusion that bonus speed doesn't actually help you steal. It needs to be base speed, so bonus speed doesn't help in that regard. But Juggernauts is fantastic. She can use it without speed penalty because she's so <laughs> she's so uh, buff. And 85 hit, 30 might is pretty damn decent. Has a little bit of crit on it as well. So yeah. There are just so many good items you can steal in this ROM, like the stone spell, for example. My goodness, that gives you so much utility when you use it. And there's probably a bunch of items that I haven't found yet, so Hanako is well worth training just for the items she can provide to you. Then it's time to review the boss of this chapter, and that is the Berserker Karma. And uh, Karma has, on paper, a very scary build, because she has both counter and counter magic as well as uh, the natural crit boost she gets from being a Berserker. She also has Watchful, so you can't steal from her, sadly. A little bit sad, considering you get Hanako in this chapter. The problem with Karma is that she doesn't have any good uh, items on her. I mean, she has troll items that you can't get, so she's a bit of a troll boss. Uh, but the fact that she has a Devil Axe makes her a very weak boss, in my opinion. Uh, that makes her two stars. She can be a little bit scary if she gets to jump on you and smacks you in the face with it, but... If she had like a tomahawk, she'd be so much more scary, because then if you attack her, counter magic or counter will proc, and then she might kill you in the retaliation. Now you can pretty much just murder her from true range, and she won't be able to do much to stop you. She'll still deal some damage to you, but again, counter and counter magic cannot kill in this ROM, so you don't really need to worry about that. So overall, not a very scary boss. Most scary aspect of her uh, are her four leadership stars. The rest of her isn't really that big a deal. Uh, she will move off her throne, though, so be careful. She will actually charge straight at you. So if you're not careful, she might intercept this group a little bit earlier than you might think. So that's like the only thing you need to be a little bit aware of. But uh, overall, not a very scary boss. And then it's time to continue with Chapter 9. We're going to begin with Cherry's route and then do Farton's route later. And uh, first out, we get the Tana replacement Wrath. Still a Pegasus Knight, just like Tana. So she's comparable to her, although her stats may vary a little bit depending on Boons and Banes. Uh, a big problem with Wrath is her low con. This is a problem Tana had as well. I think a Constitution Bane would have really helped her out here. Because she's going to take speed penalties from every single Lance in the game, which is very annoying. Uh, Wrath has a very simple gimmick, she has a lot of skills. Shade, which is actually surprisingly good in this uh, version of the ROM, because it means enemies will almost never go for her. So you can place her in a range of an archer, for example, and place another unit in range of the archer, and the archer will go for that unit. She has Imbue, so she heals herself, and this is nice, because she does actually have a magic growth. She has Relief, so she heals even more when she's on her own, which she often will be, being a Pegasus Knight. And Tantivy, which also gives her crit and avoid if she's on her own. So she's she she's at her best when she's off away from the rest of her, uh, the army, seizing objectives, killing off enemies, stuff like that. She can also proc Dragon Veins, which is nice. Uh, her growth rates are okay. Uh, she has decent strength, average skill and speed, a little bit low luck, uh, and kind of low magic. I kind of wish she had more magic, because she definitely has uh, a very magic-inspired build. I'll show you why, based on her uh, personal weapon, the Gable, which has the skill Arcane Blade attached to it. So whenever she's attacking with this weapon, she gets 3 plus magic divided by 2 hit and crit. Which isn't that much now. I mean, like, if we take a look at her magic, 9 magic, so that, that rounds down to 4. So that's 7% extra hit and crit. So, honestly, I kind of wish Wrath had a lot more magic. I think that this plus Imbue would have made her a lot better. I still think she's a decent unit. I rate her 3 out of 5 stars. Not fantastic, but 
not like insanely good either. She's kind of hard to train. You can send her into the tower, of course, and kill children. That's easy to do with everyone, but I'm rating them as if you don't do that. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I see her potential. She's She has a cute little build. I think it could have been done better. But she's a useful unit. Flyers are always nice, and I do like how she gets a bunch of bonuses when she's on her own, which is which is uh, always appreciated. And then we come to another Patreon unit that, that was originally added to Farton's route, but we decided to have her join here in Cherry's route. It is Jen the Myrmidon. And Jen is another very simple but effective build. She's a Myrmidon that procs Astra a lot. She has Astra as well as Rightful God. So at base, she has like a 38% you know, chance to proc Astra. Now, this is nice. It means she will kill whatever she goes up against most of the time. But it also means she'll burn true weapon uses like nothing else, because when this procs, it will consume extra durability, so keep this in mind. Like, if you use her Wind Sword, which is a good weapon, uh, she will very often just proc her Astra and attack five times with the Wind Sword and waste a bunch of durability. So, while Astra is a good skill, it is an expensive skill, so be mindful of that if you give her, like, very advanced weaponry, like Silver Swords and whatnot. You will, you will burn through them fast. Uh, Jen has pretty decent basis for her join time. Uh, she's a little bit higher level in the Farton Rod. I think she joins at level 13 in the Farton Rod, so she's leveled down here a little bit. But these are fantastic stats for a level 7 Mermaid on 10 strength, 13 speed, 18 skill. She's going to cap her skill for sure. Decent luck too. So her, her avoid will be pretty good. Uh, she's a completely serviceable unit. I, I would say she's neither bad nor good. She's 3 star, 3 out of 5 stars. I think she's okay. Astra is a cute gimmick, but it does get a little bit annoying sometimes when she burns through expensive swords. So, yeah, completely serviceable unit. And then we come to the Amelia replacement, Sakal the Journeyman. Replacing Amelia, his stats are obviously shit. Five strength, five speed, it's not very good. 12 luck is good, though, at this point. And uh, he has just a single skill. He was changed a little bit back from when I played the ROM. He used to have a bunch of, like... I think he had Lock Touch and Steady Stance, which was kind of interesting, but now he has Double Lion, so every weapon that he uses becomes a Brave Weapon. This does not stack with Brave Weapons, by the way. He won't attack four times with a Brave Axe, for example. Uh, Sakal is a unit with a lot of potential. It comes with a personal weapon, the Incadeus, which is a beefed-up Steel Axe. It still slows him down by four points at base. You want to be a little bit cautious with this one. I think a Constitution Stat Booster would, would be very beneficial on Sakal. And uh, he has decent growth rates, 61% strength, 60% skill. I think these are made to let him cap out most of his stats. At least I think that's how the creator distributed his growth rates. Um, so he's very easy to train. Like, it, you just attack with a hand axe and you chip, and he'll get like 50 experience from that since he's a journeyman. So he's not hard to train at all. And uh, if you train him up, he becomes very, very decent. He has insane potential. So I'm going to rate him 4 out of 5 stars. Uh, once you get him up to just a fighter or even a warrior or a berserker, I estimate that he will kill pretty much everything. Uh, I lost him myself. I killed him as a red unit uh, when I encountered him on the in, in the Farton route. I did try using him a little bit in the chair route, but he never went anywhere for me. Uh, but I can definitely recognize his insane potential. He's a little bit hard to get going, but once he does, he will most likely kill everything. So double line is a very, very strong skill. And then we come to the boss of Chapter 9, Teach the Sniper. Teach has very strong stats. You want to be very careful with this guy. He has 20 strength and 13 speed, but his skills are a bit of a joke. He has Relief, uh, he gets Crit Boost from the Sniper, Forger, and Watchful. So he has a bunch of items which you cannot steal. He's another bit of a troll boss. But being a sniper, he's incredibly easy to kill. I mean, all you do is just surround him. Now, a little bit of a note here, when you enter the arena, if you do, I think if you do arena two or three times on this map, he will charge you. Uh, it's a special event that DS Noon added in for this chapter. So, but again, since he doesn't have close counter, you just need four units to surround him with, and you can just, like, bully him to death. For that reason, he's not very scary at all, one star. Um, like, if you're gonna make a sniper boss, you better give him close counter, or some kind of means of retaliating at, at range, or, or place, or sorry, at close range, or place him in such a position where he'll be harder to deal with. But I think, if I remember correctly, the creator of Teach made him literally so that you could taint on him. Yeah, look at that. His description says, perfect trainee trainer, loves taint. He made this... <laughs> the creator made this boss so that you could train Sakal on him, which is pretty generous, honestly. If only he didn't give him Watchful, he'd be even more generous. But I guess he wanted to troll a little bit. 
And then it's time to take a look at the joining characters in chapter 10. And here we get, in my opinion, one of the best units in the ROM, Jack Garland, the hero. He replaces Innes, so his stats are fantastic, because uh, Innes has a really high personal basis due to being a sniper. I felt like, I, th I think they felt like they needed to give him extra stats because sniper stats aren't very good. And as a result, when you change him to a hero, you get this, which is just incredible. Little low on strength, but 21 speed is just incredible. I mean, Jack Garland is a dodge tank. Uh, he has a leadership star, which is nice. Khan is also very solid. He can use axes without losing speed. And he has uh, a very fun uh, gimmick. He has Hero, so he activates his skill uh, more when he's on low health. And he has Petrify, which I didn't, I didn't realize how strong the skill was until I saw it in action. I mean, this is just incredible. Whenever it procs, you inflict stone status on your opponent, which not only takes them out of action for five turns, but it also sets their avoidance to zero and gives your units 30% bonus crit against them. So this is pretty much a death sentence. Whenever this procs, that unit is as good as dead. Which is fantastic, because uh, Jack can petrify multiple enemies uh, each turn, thanks to his personal weapon, which I'll show very soon. He also has Silent Pride. If he is below 25% health, he essentially takes 6 less damage and deals 6 extra damage, which is fantastic. It's a little risky to have him walk around on low health, but it can absolutely save his life. He can also activate Dragon Veins, which is nice. Now, this build on its own is not what makes Jack Garland so scary. What makes him scary is his personal weapon, the Rebellion. This is a sword that has no might, it only has one might, but it allows him to attack at 1-2 range, and it increases his chance to uh, petrify enemies by 10%. You put this weapon on Jack and send him into a horde of enemies, and he will petrify about half of them most of the time, because he doubles, so he has a two chances to proc petrify. This is so nice because it just sets up kills for the rest of your squad. Like, the amount of support that Jack offers your team is just incredible. Um, I mean, he's strong too. If you if you want him to kill stuff, he can. I mean, he has good bases. And I also think his growth rates are perfectly aligned so that he should cap most of his stats at level 20. At least that's what I think when I look at these stats right here. The only exception to this is his low rest growth. As you can see, he only has a 2% rest growth. Uh, but yeah, you can equip him with good weapons and he'll he'll definitely he'll definitely kill stuff. He has fantastic weapon ranks. A little low axe rank, but A rank and swords, which is nice. But yeah, it's the Rebellion sword that makes him so incredibly good. This alone trivializes certain chapters. Because it not only allows Jack to get kills, but it allows him to set up kills for his allies. Which is what makes him such a fantastic support unit. So, he's another easy 5 stars. Just having Jack will make every single chapter easier for your entire team. So uh, this is one of the most creative builds in the entire ROM, I think. And then we come to the Garrick replacement, Garibon. A lot of people uh, asked me whether or not we nerfed this guy because his stats seem lower. Uh, I was actually the one who messed up when I created Garibon. I gave him a double HP boon without realizing it, which is why he came with 41 HP at base. I decided to correct this later because, yeah, I get it. Uh, I made a mistake, but I, I still think it's a little bit ridiculous because I don't even think Garibon's creator wanted a double HP boon. I don't, think he, I don't think he even wanted an HP boon, if I remember correctly. I don't remember exactly what he gave him. But uh, if you look at Garibon's stats, they're based on Garrick, which means he's incredible. 17 base strength is fantastic. 16 base defense. He is so unbelievably bulky. Uh, he also has a bunch of skills, which makes him better on enemy face, which is a little bit odd, because uh, Vyvern Riders, they're not really known for being good on enemy face, because they can't benefit from terrain. But he gets 6 extra damage whenever uh, he gets attacked, and he also gets 4 defense and resistance when attacked. So this means that Garibon can tank arrows. Uh, he's got 20 defense at base, so even against archers, they'll only they'll uh, they'll only chip him. So uh, you don't even need to give him a Felix shield. He'll do just fine. He also has blue flame. Again, I almost never take advantage of this, but it, it I, I don't really... Yeah, I, I, I never really use this skill much. Uh, 14 con is fantastic, it means he can use steel lances without being slowed down, and he does in fact come with a steel lance, which is nice. If uh, Garabon has any weaknesses, I'd say it's his low res, as well as uh, being a little bit slow at base. 12 speed isn't quite enough to double enemies at this stage during the game, and 40% speed growth me means he can be a little bit speed screwed sometimes. I still rate him 4 out of 5 stars though, he's a fantastic flyer, really bulky. If you train him up, he'll become amazing. And then we have our Tetis replacement, Mercy. Being a dancer, she's an easy 5-star. I mean, she could have had no skills, and she'd still be a 5-star unit, because dancers are just that strong. 
Uh, but she does have some skills. She has Wary Fighter, so she'll never be double. And she also has Spur Defense, so whenever she's adjacent to units, she makes them a little bit harder to kill. And Bond, so she passively heals a little bit. I never found this super useful, but it's nice, I guess. Uh, Very Finder is an interesting skill to have on a Dancer. I think I would have picked more buff skills on her, personally. Uh, she doesn't have any speed. Uh, but I find that this is a bit of a detriment to her because it means that she, her avoidance won't really go up that much. So she still get hit. This is why the creator gave her 90% defense and resistance. So if you train her, she will actually cap her defense and rest and become unkillable eventually. But it takes her a little while to get there. So again, she's still five stars because she's a dancer. But I think this unit could have been done better. I think there are better skills you can put on a dancer than wary fighter. I would. I think it's better to just dump everything you have into speed and luck and just give her a bunch of buff skills. But at least she has spur defense, which is nice. Then we come to the Marissa replacement, uh, Professor Hero. Uh, he's the worst unit in the game. This unit is terrible and a joke and a meme. It's a Blossom unit, so he gets half experience, double growth rates, and keep up. So yay, if he's within Kanto or Kanto plus units, he gets two move. This, this unit sucks. This, this unit is terrible. I know people like Professor Hero because I keep shit talking him during my streams. Sure, 16 con is nice, I guess. He, he can use lances without getting excited. This unit fucking sucks. Why would you train this unit? I, I hate this unit, one star. But I'm sure I'm gonna get a bunch of comments from people saying, like, oh, I like Professor Hero. I sent him into the tower and I, I trained him. I don't, I don't give a shit. Professor Hero sucks. And then it's time to review the boss of Chapter 10, Thomas. I think I think there's some, yeah, true, true. I think there's some tank engine jokes going on here. Uh, Thomas looks absolutely terrifying when you look at him. Uh, not only does he have terrifying sets, but he will charge at you. And being a berserker, he'll move over the mountains. So be a little bit uh, careful of this. You look at this guy and you're like, oh my good goodness. 19 strength, 22 speed, and he has double lion. This unit is terrifying, right? I mean, just look at, look, look he has a hand axe, he has a killer axe. And this unit seems like he'll absolutely murder your units. And he has three leadership stars. But the thing is, due to this way the, the map is laid out, he actually ends up becoming a complete joke because he'll move down here and then he'll start moving over the mountains here. And he'll usually end up around here somewhere. And when he does, you will have cleared out most of the units in this area and you'll have lots of units here. And you can just swamp him and kill him. Uh, what I did was I just killed him with Jack. Because... He can't hit Jack. He has 16 skill and a hand axe, which hand axe have 60 base hit. So, sure, he has a double lion, which is a little scary, but I didn't find him all that uh, dangerous to deal with. I, I'll rate him 2 out of 5 stars just due to the layout of this map and the fact that you can deal with him completely in isolation. Because, again, he moves down here, moves over the mountains, and then you can, you can just gangbang him when he's in this area. And I didn't find him to be all that scary. Maybe if you lose Jack, he's a little bit worse. Because if you can't petrify him, sure. If he attacks you with a killer axe, which has the brave effect, I can see that being potentially a little scary. 22 speed is pretty pretty terrifying. He might actually quad your units. But I didn't find him all that scary to deal with, just due to the amount of scary units you have access to at this point during the game. And then it's time to talk about the playable characters in Chapter 11. Starting with the Lara Shell uh, replacement, Sigri the Thief. And uh, Sigrid is, in my opinion, the best thief in the ROM. Uh, she's a little bit hard to use initially because she has very low bases, being a level 3 thief. So you want to be a little bit cautious with her in her joining chapter. Uh, but Sigrid has a very funny gimmick in that she gives you money. Uh, whenever she kills an enemy, and this, this happens uh, even if she kills them on enemy phase or if she has full inventory, she'll uh, activate a red gem. And because she comes with Rightful God, uh, this means that she activates it pretty much all the time. Uh, on ba At base, she has like, what, a 48% chance to activate it, and once she caps luck, that's like a, what, 70% chance to give you a red gem? That can really snowball. This gives you a lot of money. And additionally, uh, Sigri has the Dine Sleeve, which at first glance isn't very impressive. It's just a, a sword with 1-2 range that never breaks. But having this sword is insanely useful because it offers her unlimited 1-2 range attacks. Sure, 4 Might is laughable, she'll hardly deal damage with it at first, but once you train her up, this becomes insane. Once she becomes an assassin, and by the way, she will get lethality once she becomes an assassin, 
Uh, this sword will allow her to just clear out entire packs of enemies because she'll proc lethality at range, thanks to the Rightful Goddess, which is just incredible. Uh, her growth rates are balanced in all areas. 60% uh, strength, 60% luck is pretty decent. Uh, she'll cap luck for sure. Um, she'll even cap strength, I think, because Assassin and Rogue strength caps are so low. A little frail, though, so you want to be a bit, a bit careful with her. But overall, I found her to just be an incredibly versatile utility unit. She gives you ton of, tons of money, and once she becomes an assassin, my goodness, she'll just kill everything. So for that reason, I rated her five stars. I, I think she is easily one of the best utility units in the ROM. Uh, she joins a little late. I mean, she's not quite up there with units like Schumanner, but she's still a fantastic unit. Because you actually do need money in this ROM. There's a lot of good items you can buy. And uh, you might actually run out of it if you miss certain treasure chests and stuff like that. So having having just a unit which constantly supplies you with gold and then eventually becomes an assassin, which clears out like s squads of enemies with 1-2 range, is really nice. You can also give her weapon over to both Sam and Jen. They can both use it. So just a, an added bit of utility for, for them if you should not decide to use Sigray, but you want to give her weapon away. And then we come to the Dostla replacement, Groroth, the Cyclops. And I think I'm going to give Donlotch the award for most creative build. This is a very creative build. At first, it looks a little odd. You look at this guy and you're like, oh boy, he doesn't have speed? 0% speed and luck? How will this work, right? But then you take a look at his skills. He has Frenzy. So he deals more damage the more wounded he gets. He has Vantage, so when he's below half health, he will strike first. Wind Disciple, so he gets extra hit and avoid when he's wounded. And Silent Pride, so he gets extra damage and takes less damage when he's wounded. So, Groroth has a, an insanely fun setup where you bring him as low as you possibly can. Bring him to, like, one health if you can. And then you give him the Hatchet or a Hand Axe or otherwise a very accurate weapon. Hatchet is absolutely the best weapon for him. And what you're going to get is you're going to get a unit that strikes first, that just straight up one-shot things. So, he just kills everything with uh, with the first strike. It doesn't quite work against bulky enemies that are too strong to be one-shot, but against mages, he can just clear out, like, ten mages. Uh, but he needs to have a good uh, hit chance. This is very important. So, this is why I say the hatchet is so good on him. It is a tricky build to set up, but once you do, man, it's so much fun. Uh, I, I would say, like, if I were to rate this unit, like, a fun rating, I'd probably give him five stars. But in terms of, like, pure utility, I think I, I'm going to have to give him 3 out of 5 stars. I was thinking maybe 4 stars, because it is a fun build, but Groroth has a ton of weaknesses that makes him very hard to use. And his setup, while it is fun, it's not that good in terms of, like, pure utility, because it only works against a certain set of enemies. He's not going to be able to one-shot generals, even at one health, for example, unless he has a hammer. Um... So, it's, it's a fun build, but it's not super versatile. It just has it points during the game where it really shines. But a problem with Groro is that he's a monster class. And there are many bosses in this game, including many generics, which come with S-rank weapons. And these S-rank weapons are super effective against monsters. So, they'll absolutely murder Groro. They're like Excalibur tomes on generics in the late game. And that just doesn't treat Groro very nicely. So, for that reason alone, I can't really in good conscience rate him any more than 3 out of 5 stars. But if he didn't have that weakness, I'd say he's probably a four-star unit. And then it's time to review the boss of Chapter 11, Dio Brando. I gotta say, though, whoever made this portrait is insanely good. This is a very, very solid portrait. And uh, Dio is an incredibly scary boss, mostly due to the layout of the map. He has Astra, Vantage, and Rightful Lord. So he, if he jumps you out of the fog with a killer bow or a brave bow, you're in trouble you're in big trouble. And because of the fog, and due to the layout of, of this map, he is far more likely to get the jump on you than you are to get the jump on him, because of course the AI cheats in Fog of War. So, uh, he's an incredibly scary boss. I would rate him 4 out of 5 stars. This, this is this is one of the bosses in the early game that is most likely to kill one of your units, I'd say. Uh, if it wasn't Fog of War, I think it'd be a lot easier to deal with, because you could just lure him in with like a bow, and then like surround him. But, What's going to happen here is he's most likely going to jump you from out the fog, kill one of your units, and then if you don't kill him, he's just going to equip the Sword Slayer and kill one of your sword units. So, an incredibly scary boss. He does have a Hoplon Guard, which you want to steal. But, uh, yeah, be, be very careful about this boss. He will absolutely mess you up. 
And then it's time to review the playable characters of Chapter 12, starting with the Sailor replacement, Scutum. This used to be Hisoka, but we replaced him. I'm not gonna go into detail here. If you know why, you know why. Scutum is an absolutely fantastic uh, late game pre-promote. I wouldn't even say he's late game, more like mid game. He joins fairly early in the Cherry route. In Farton route, he only joins in Chapter 16, so a little bit later. But I mean, just look at this unit. He has incredible stats in all areas and uh, in very decent growth rates as well. Only low growth rate he has is Luck and Rest, but he has a fantastic rest base, so it doesn't really bother him that much. Uh, and he has Renewal, which is, you know, it's a decent skill. Heals him up every turn, makes him less reliant on healers, but he comes with Nihil, and this is one of the reasons why he's fantastic. You guys know how important Nihil is in this room. There's so much BS later on, so many monkeys, so much stupid crap that DS Noon and PH put into this. Nihil bypasses all of that, which automatically makes Scootum a five-star unit. Just the fact that he can deal with that is so incredibly useful. And uh, additionally, it comes with a personal weapon, the Royal Lance. This is a javelin that never breaks. This is fantastic. I mean, sure, it's a javelin. You have access to unlimited javelins at this point during the game. But it's still nice to have. You'll never have to replace javelins on this guy. Just, he'll always have the Royal Lance available. He'll always have one to range available. It's not fantastic, but it's pretty useful. So yeah, overall, just a, an amazing unit. Solid weapon ranks too. B rank in swords, A rank in lances. I mean, this is pretty much the purse of all of the rum, with the added benefit of being able to completely bypass any BS thrown at you in the late game. One leadership star is the cherry on top. Buffs your entire army. I have nothing bad to say about this unit. Aside from the fact that his base luck is a little on the low side. You might want to give him a hopland guard, but as you've seen, there are plenty of hopland guards to go around. Then we come to the Yuan replacement, Ganondorf the Rekruza. Very simple build on this one, he just has Paragon. This is a lot of fun actually, because recruits already gain an insane amount of experience. Add Paragon on top of that, he'll gain a level every time he hits something. It's it's insanely fun to, to use. Uh, growth rates are okay in most areas. I mean, he has the same growth rates as everyone else. He's an insane amount of defense. 80% defense growth. He'll, he'll cap his defense regardless of what class you promote him into, which is good. Um, I wouldn't say this is a, like a super good unit though, if I'm going to be completely honest. He has the Phantom Lance, which is kind of a javelin with improved stats, which is uh, very well fitted for him. It's kind of like a hatchet in javelin form. So this is makes it very easy for him to get kills early on. But I wouldn't say that this is like a super strong unit. I'd rate him two stars. Uh, again, you train him up, he becomes decent, but he doesn't really have anything special about him. His skills doesn't help him in combat. He just gains very, he just gains a lot of experience. And at this point during the ROM, you have plenty of good, strong units that can carry you. You don't really need to train Ganondorf, but if you do, you'll just get a ball of stats. I can't really rate him any higher than two stars, not at this point during the game. Uh, but I recognize that he has some use. He's, he's, he's an alright recruit. It's fun to use, but he's not particularly good. And then it's time to review the boss of Chapter 12, Tachyon the Sage. Uh, because he's based on a monster boss, his stats aren't super high. Uh, he has Nihil, which is eh, okay. Uh, at this point during the game, you do have some skills, so just be aware they won't work on this guy. And he has Trample, so be careful if this guy attacks your unmounted units. He does come with the Excalibur Tome. This is the point of the game where we let bosses have S-rank weapons. So be careful about this. This can really mess you up. Uh, he will murder Ormond and Groroth at this point, because Excal Excalibur deals bonus damage to monsters. So do not let him near any of those units. He will absolutely crush them. So against anyone else, though, I don't find him super scary. His crit is a little high. Steal his Hoplon Guard. You definitely want to do that. But uh, he's, he's an okay boss. Three stars. Uh, be a little bit uh, cautious about him. He will move. He'll he'll charge you, in fact. So he'll he'll run at you right away. So. You wanna, you wanna make sure that your early squad, which will deal with him at some point, have a unit capable of murdering him. Uh, any kind of barrier boost or pure water will be very effective against him because his might isn't very high. He only has 16 magic. So just make sure you barrier up some kind of strong mage killer and they can probably take him out really easily. All right, so up next, we have another Patreon unit. We have Ukasha the Adventurer. And Ukasha is an absolutely fantastic support unit. Being an adventurer, he has access to both bows and staves. He comes with A rank in bows, C rank in staves. So you can use silver bows at base, he has a long bow, and he can also use staves like men and barrier. And if you give him some additional staff experience, he'll be a very good healer. 
Now, being an adventurer, Ukasha has both strength and magic, which is very nice. And while he is a little bit frail, his stats are definitely good enough to carry him throughout the game, even if you don't give him that many kills. He'll continuously generate experience from staves either way, so it's not like you need to give him lots of kills. Uh, growth rates are very balanced in all areas, like 40 to 50, 30% defense, a little low, 45% HP, also a little low. As I said, Ukasha is a little frail. You might experience him, him dying very easily in the late game, which is like one of his biggest weaknesses. But the thing about Ukasha is he's not a unit you send into a huge horde of enemies. You keep him in the back lines and you use him for support because he has a particular set of skills that just makes him a nightmare for people like you. <laughs> he has seal defense, seal resistance, uh, which is fantastic. This is really good against bosses, you know. Any boss you have that you struggle to kill because of their high defenses, just send Ukash at them. He doesn't even need to get retaliated upon because he can do this with a longbow and he'll just make them a lot easier to kill. Pass is fantastic, he gets this from the Adventure class, just allows him so much more mobility, and he also has a chance to petrify, which I've already talked about how good this skill is with Jack Garland. He doesn't have as high chance to proc it as Jack does, and since he's an archer, it's not like he can proc a bunch of it on enemy face, but it's still very nice whenever it occurs. Like. You want to attack a boss with Ukasha anyway to debuff him, and then if it doesn't work, you might have a chance of petrifying the boss, which will basically take it out of action, which is just fantastic. And then you have a very nice bonus in his two leadership stars, which just gives 2% hidden avoid to your entire army. So there's never a situation where Akasha isn't useful. Even if you don't give him that many kills, he should have a spot on your team for the rest of the game, just because of his fantastic utility and buffs and debuffs. It's just amazing. A really, really solid support unit. Four out of five stars. Easily. Then we have yet another Patreon unit in Issa, the Knight. And a uh, little bit of a side note here, if you accidentally kill her or you fail to recruit her, she'll still show up in the next chapter. Just, just in case. Uh, I accidentally killed her in my playthrough, so we added a bit of an event for that. So Issa is a very tanky unit. So <laughs> looking at her, she seems very strange. She's, she's a Knight with 19 base defense, and then she gets plus 10. Why does she get plus 10? Well, she has Renewal, so she heals. She has Fear Stance, so she gets extra damage on enemy face. And she has Fortress Defense, which gives her five extra defense at the cost of minus three strength and magic. Uh, she has no magic anyway, so she only gets minus three strength. And she has the Titan Lance, which is a Steel Lance with plus five defense when held. This is why she has plus 10. So at base, this unit has 29 defense. I mean, she will not die to anything physical. And she also, to complement this, has a pretty decent resistance growth. Now, Issa, I get what the creator was going for here, like a very self-sustainable uh, multi-purpose tank, but I will say that because Issa cannot really double that well with 5 base speed, I mean, sure, 45% speed isn't awful, but it's going to take her a very long while to grow to the point where she's not going to get doubled anymore. And I don't think she'll ever get to a point where she will realistically double. Not in this late game, at least not on the difficult uh, mode. Maybe like on normal mode, but I'm rating the units as if they're being playing, played on the hardest difficulty. Like, I, I get where this unit is going. Like, I understand the concept behind the build, but I just, I don't really think units that don't double are worth much. Like, if you send her into a bunch of enemies, sure, she might hit them once, but there are units in this realm who can tank equally well, either by dodging or just by having a lot of defenses, and they can also do very decent damage. They can double reliably, for example. And Issa just can't do that. And if she wields her Titan Lance, she can't retaliate at range, so she's kind of stuck with a short spare, and... Yeah, I just don't think she's that fantastic, in my opinion. I rate her 2 out of 5 stars. Uh, I was contemplating 1 star, but she can tank, and there is some precedence for that in this ROM. Enemies do hit pretty hard in the late game, so I do see the purpose of having a good tank, but I would rather have a unit that actually kills whatever they go up against, and Issa doesn't do this reliably. And up next, we have the Cormac replacement, Delphine the Archer. Now, looking at Delphine, I very much like this build. She has decent bases, uh, thanks to being a Cormac replacement. And she has decent strength, alright speed. Just solid growth rates in all areas, except for resistance. A good, good distribution of stats right here. And she furthermore has Battle Veteran, which gives her extra damage and hit when she levels up. And yes, a promoted unit is treated as level 20. So if she's level uh, 5 promoted, then she's treated as level 25 for the purposes of this skill. Opportunist is a very solid skill for any archer to have, because they usually fire things that can't shoot back. So this, this more often than not just translates to 4 extra damage. And additionally, she has Vanity, which gives her 2 additional damage and 10 extra hit when fighting at 2 range, which is pretty much all the time, except if she uses a longbow, I guess. I don't think this triggers against enemies at tree range. I think they specifically needs to be two tiles away for this to work. 
So, yeah, looking at this unit, one leadership star, that's respectable as well. Comes with a killer bow, C rank in bows. It's not a bad archer, there's just nothing spectacular about her either. I, I rate her a 3 out of 5 stars. She's perfectly serviceable if you need a bow unit. She's easy to train their flyers to shoot down. But at this point during the game, where you start to get really strong pre-promoted units, she does feel a little underwhelming. But I'd say this is as good as a mid-game archer can be. Like, I don't really see how you could make this unit any better than it already is. Like, it's an archer that focuses on dealing damage. The problem is you have units like Lanta, who just kills everything and joins much earlier. But Delphine is a serviceable replacement archer if Lanta died, I guess. Then it's time to review the boss of Chapter 13, Crackers the Dreadfighter. And let me tell you, this guy will be your biggest challenge that you'll encounter thus far on Cherry Mode. This guy is just insane. I mean, he doesn't deal a lot of damage because he has uh, he has both Fortress Defense and Fortress Resistance, so he loses 6 Strength and Magic combined. But what this guy has is insane durability. I mean, just look at this guy. He has 21 Defense, 22 Resistance at base. It will vary a little bit depending on hard mode bonuses, but he'll usually be somewhere around 20. He also has 21 Speed, which is incredible. And he comes with Voice of Peace, so he takes even less damage. And he steals your luck, so you are more likely to get crit on enemy face or against other opponents. And if he happens to be alone, which he often will be, because enemies will usually have left by the time you reach him, he'll also get extra hit and avoid. And he's standing on a fort. Just look at his avoidance, 54 avoidance. He has Excalibur, which gives him 5 extra speed, and he also has 18 base might, which is really powerful. And if he gets injured, he'll swap to his rune sword and start healing himself. So this guy is just insanely hard to kill. You can steal his Hoplon Guard if you want to, that'll make it a little bit easier for you to fight him but you need to be very fast for that to happen. Uh, I don't actually know if the bonus speed counts towards stealing. I know that having plus five speed doesn't make you able to steal more. So based on that, it might mean that you don't need more than 17 speed to steal from him. I actually don't know. It would be nice if someone clarified this in the comment section. I don't know. But I will say, so far, this guy is definitely the hardest challenge. I mean, he's based on Ayas, which is a boss that's very hard to kill in Vanilla Sacred Stones. So I'm going to rate this guy five stars. He is definitely one of the hardest bosses in the game. And definitely the hardest boss on Cherry's route. There is no... So up next we have the Renak replacement, Bourbon. Chat kept yelling at me that I was pronouncing it wrong, but you're just gonna have to deal with it. Uh, Bourbon right here, as I said, he is the Renak replacement, so if you don't have Sigri at this point, it'll cost you around 10,000 gold to recruit him. So keep Sigri alive unless you want to pay a lot of money to get this dude. I did not, and I was actually not able to recruit him in my run because I didn't have the money for it, which is kind of annoying. So Bourbon, he is a dread fighter. This means that he can use swords and magic. His magic rank isn't super high, but his sword rank is. And he comes with a wind sword, which is very nice. And uh, equal strength and magic. His skill is ridiculously high at 25. I think he got a skill boon for some reason. The problem is, uh, the skill won't really help him that much because his adept skill is based on speed and not skill. I think the creator may have misunderstood this. In some Fire Emblem games, adept goes off skill. Other Fire Emblem games, it goes off speed. It's a little bit random. So this won't really help him all that much, but it's still nice when it triggers. Intimidate is a nice support skill, lowers a void, and he also has Shove, which is another nice support skill. This can save your ass sometimes, if you really need to push a unit forward in one tile. It is not as versatile, I find, as like draw, drag back or reposition. Uh, it's a little bit harder to use, because you generally, you, you either have to go and push people backwards, or you have to go and push them forwards, which, you know, can sometimes be good, but I find it very hard to take advantage of it, really. Uh, his growth rates are very focused on speed, so he will definitely cap his speed, as well as his strength, but I do find it a little sad that the creator gave him a 10% magic growth. I mean, he is a dread fighter, he should be able to use both physical and magical weapons, but... Thanks to having a 10% magic growth, his magic won't really go that much on its own unless you give him stat boosters, which is a little sad. I think he should have had maybe at least a 30% magic growth, maybe taken away a couple points of speed and HP. I don't know. Nancon is okay. He only uses swords and anima, which are fairly light, so this won't hurt him that much. His luck is awful, though. 6 base luck, 20% luck growth. This sucks. He definitely needs a hoplon guard, lest he wants to get crit. And he also has a leadership star, which is fine. Uh, Bourbon is a completely serviceable pre-promote. Three out of five stars. He's like a nice unit that you can add to your team if you've lost a lot of guys or if you just didn't train that many people. He is not, like, breathtakingly spectacular or anything. He's just kind of nice. I mean, he, he, his stats look a lot better than they are because of that 25 skill, but skill is one of the worst stat points for points. So having 25 skill, it doesn't really benefit him that much. Swords and anima tomes are super accurate anyway, so he's not going to have any difficulties hitting, especially not with Intimidate. So a little bit of a weird unit, but he's all right, I guess. 
And then we have the boss of this chapter, which is Davis. Hey, it's my editor. I actually don't know if this was Davis's edit. I think someone else submitted him, but it's a really cool portrait. I gotta say, this, this portrait is extremely well made. Uh, Davis is a hero, and he has a very classic build, Pavice, which nullifies physical attacks, and Hero, which increases the proc chance of Pavice whenever he's below half health. However, you can just use a magic unit and absolutely murder this guy. He moves off his throne, by the way, so as soon as you enter the room, he will charge at you. Uh, and, um, yeah, just use a magic unit. He's not really that scary to deal with at all. He has a Brave Sword, a Sword Slayer, and a Tomahawk. So you do need to be careful. Uh, don't send a Sword unit in. He will absolutely murder them. But what you do is you just send a unit in, pull him at two range with a Tomahawk, and then you just massacre him. Steal his Hoplon Guard first, and just, like, kill him with mages. He can't really do that much against them. Like, he's a little bit fast. You gotta be a little bit careful. But he loses three points of speed from the Tomahawk. So he's not going to be as fast as you think. You should have trained at this point some strong magic units that can very easily deal with him. Just don't send physical units at him because he will proc Pavice and that'll suck. So, yeah. Two out of five stars. Not a, not a very strong boss at all. Alright, so before we continue with chapter 16, we're going to go back to the chapter 9 of Farton's routes. And we're going to take a look at the bosses and some of the unique units that join here. This is the chapter where you get Wrath, but we already talked about her, so there's no point. So we're just going to go straight to the boss of this chapter, which is Marty. Marty's a scary boss. A very scary boss. His stats are a joke, except for his strength and defense, which are insanely high. But that's not really what makes this guy scary. He has Devil's Luck. So, not only is he immune to the Devil Backfire, but he will curse you with Devil Backfire. And not only that, he will curse you with his Devil Backfire. And note that this guy has one luck, so that it pretty much means any unit that goes up against this guy has a 30% chance to backfire on themselves. Which is terrifying. Deadeye, this means that he will never miss this attack, because it doubles his total hit rate. Just look at his hit rate. 212. You're not dodging this guy. I don't care if you're a sword unit, I don't care if you're cherry on a pillar with supports, he's hitting you. He is hitting you regardless. There is no unit in the ROM at this point which will have anywhere ne close to like 150 or 160 avoid. It won't happen. So you can't dodge this guy. You have to kill him from a distance. But if you kill him from a distance, he'll backfire on you with Devil's Slug. I mean, just a terrifying boss to go up against. Your only choice is to use Schumanner, which I think is your only Nihil unit at this point. So what you need to do is you need to use Schumanner and you need to kill him with Fenrir. But the problem is Schumanner can't kill him that easily because this guy has 79 HP and he even has decent defense and resistance. So he won't die to like a single Fenrir. Schumanner might double him at this point uh, if you've trained Schumanner properly because he only has three speed. I think it is doable for your Schumanner to have eight or nine effective speed with Fenrir if you gave him a lot of levels. Uh, but it's gonna be tough. This is definitely a five-star boss. This is a very tricky boss to deal with. It requires a lot of luck to get through. Uh, if you don't have Schumanner at this point, if you lost him, then God help you. You're gonna have a very, very bad time against Marty. He will charge straight at you, so he'll come running at you as quickly as possible. It's usually the group on the right-hand side who will deal with him, so make sure you have Schumanner on the right-hand side. Whatever you do, make sure you have Schumanner on the right-hand side. And then you're just gonna have to pray to the RNG gods that they are benevolent and don't backfire on you. You. So up next, we are jumping into chapter 10 of Farton's Route, and here you will get Creative the Ducell Replacement. Now, we have cheated a little bit. Ducell normally joins at level 10, which is extremely high, and he definitely doesn't have very good stats for a level 10 promoted unit, so we were kind to Creative and bumped him down to level 1. Otherwise, he would have just been an obsolete pre promote He would have just been benched immediately, because a level 10 promoted unit at this point doesn't get any experience, which makes him very hard to train. So we kept his stats the same, but bumped him down to level 1, because, hey, he does my timestamps. He's a cool guy. So Creative is a pretty damn good pre-promote. Um, he has very solid stats for his join time. He'll massacre pretty much everything he goes up against. Um, he has very solid growth rates in strength, skill, and speed. And he will level up defense pretty well as well. But his resistance and luck are god-awful. You need to give him a Hoplon Guard. If you don't give him a Hoplon Guard, he'll get crit. So keep one on him at all times. Luckily, uh, there are a million Hoplon Guards in this ROM. So that shouldn't be a problem unless you've been really bad at stealing them. Creative's gimmick is that he is good at self-healing. He has soul, so he can proc that to heal himself. He has life taker, so when he kills enemies, he heals himself. He has rightful lord, so he's more likely to proc soul. And he also has blue flame, in case you want to pair him up with another blue flame unit. It can be nice. And of course, being a berserker, he has that juicy crit rate. 15 con is also pretty good. He can wield most axes without losing speed. He comes with a personal weapon in the timestamp, which I just noticed has the wrong description, so I'll need to fix that. It definitely cannot be wielded by Ormond and Sev. That's, uh, that's an error. 
Uh, but it, this is just a Steel Axe with an Osferatu effect, although Creative was able to haggle away a little bit of might for some uh, hit and crits. Normally, I wouldn't allow people to do this, but again, he does my timestamps, so he's a cool guy. So yeah, Creative is a really solid mid-game at pre promote uh, Really good in most areas. Don't really have many complaints here. Uh, he does suck in the luck and resistance department, but aside from that, he's fantastic. Four out of five stars. This is pretty much as good as an average pre promote gets. And then we have uh, another Patreon unit joining the ranks, and this one can only be obtained if you trigger a Dragon Vein. He'll spawn with a bunch of green mages, and then after triggering the Dragon Vein, you need to talk to him with Farton, which can be a little bit difficult to do, so be a bit cautious. There's some enemy reinforcements coming in later here, which might kill him, so you want to try and get him quickly or after you've dealt with those. And then we get the Null Replacement Lonan. Yeah, he joins a little bit earlier on this route. I think I messed up. I thought it was a Patreon unit, but it's actually a Null Replacement, so... Yeah, just, um, he joins late earlier, I guess. Um, Lonan is a very interesting unit because he's a healer, but he comes with a personal weapon that allows him to fight. Uh, so he has 45 uses of this, which allows him to actually fight at 1 and 2 range. So he's a healer that can defend himself, which is actually kind of cool. Um, he has garbage luck, like 1 luck, which sucks, uh, but he has fortune, so he can't be crit. And then he also has insight, which uh, I guess uh, is okay doesn't really need this. He has decent hit rate already. And he also has Discipline, so he can train his weapon ranks faster. Um, Lonan actually ended up being a pretty solid unit on my team. I used him a lot, mainly because I needed staff users, and I kind of liked how he was an unpromoted priest who could, like, fight. But he does have some pretty big problems. His avoidance is garbage because of his luck is so low. And he also has four base, or his three base defense. He gets one extra from the Dragonstone, but it doesn't really help him that much. So keep him far away from enemies or give him a defensive support if you want him to live. But I think he's a completely serviceable unit. Three out of five stars. Uh, he's pretty decent. Uh, I do think that he needs some help to get it going. But uh, he's, he's a completely serviceable staff unit, and he also promotes pretty decently into a War Monk because he has both strength and magic. Although his strength stat is, or his strength growth is non existent, so you want to help him out a little bit in that area if you plan to use access on him. And then we come to the boss review of this chapter Utar Efson. I don't know what that means. Is it some kind of Icelandic thing? I, I really don't know. He's a druid, and uh, he's based on Baron, which is a pretty strong boss in the realm, so he's pretty hard to kill. Chances are you won't even get near him, because this defense chapter is pretty rough. Uh, he has a pretty weird build. He has Defiant Speed, so he gets more speed when he's below 25%. Uh, he also has defi Defiant Defense, which does the same. And then he has Bracing Stance, so he takes less damage when you attack him. Uh, these two skills don't really matter. I don't think they'll ever really come into play, but this skill is a little bit nasty. Uh, it means that he has effectively 19 defense and 23 press. It effectively means he has 19 defense and 23 rest whenever you attack him, which can be kind of hard to get through at this point. And he has Nosferatu. So unless you attack him with someone who's very dodgy, he'll probably just heal himself right up. This is a tricky boss to kill. I rate him 4 out of 5 stars. It's probably better to just leave him alone, to be honest. Uh, but if you want to kill him, you can, I guess. He doesn't have leadership stars, though, so there's really no point. I, you can't even get anything from him. You can steal his elixirs, I guess. That can work. But yeah, you don't really need to kill this guy at all. I don't think it ends the chapter, so just kind of leave him alone. There, there's no point. And then it's time to review the units on the Ghost Ship. And here you get both Sigri and Groroth, both units which we have already reviewed, but you get a new one in Farton's route, and that is Morina the Malignite. And in my opinion, this is probably the best pure support unit in the entire ROM. She has insanely good stats, except for luck, which is a little low, but nothing a hop one guard can't fix. There's a multitude of those to go around. Um, she has solid growth rates in all areas, except for luck, but again, she doesn't really need it. Just give her a hop one guard, she'll be okay. And uh, looking at Marina, I mean, not only is she fantastic at fighting, which is really useful, she comes with a personal tome in the Tizona, which is a Thunder Tome with better stats. So that's fantastic. It will last you a pretty long while, but she does just as well with a regular Thunder Tome. But what makes Marina fantastic are her support skills. She has Night Tide and Lilith's Poise. So what does this mean? Well, it means that any units adjacent to her will effectively gain plus 8 defense and rest. Because these two stack. 
They also get plus one damage, but that's not really the big deal here. The big deal is she gives eight defense and resist resistance to adjacent units. This is so goddamn broken. It also works in the arena, by the way, and it does not scale up the gladiators. So you can use Marina to arena abuse to your heart's content. Of course, you have endless grinding in this ROM, so it doesn't really matter that much, but you can do it. But the amount of times that Marina just saved my units is beyond counting. Plus eight is such a huge bonus defense and resistance to give to up to four units. It allows you to just trivialize certain chapters. As long as Marina herself can survive whatever comes against her, and she does need like a Feely shield, for example, or lest she be shot down by archers, but she's just incredible. This is a five-star unit easily because like the ability she has to just keep your units alive is so unrivaled in this realm. And the fact that she can fly means that she can also get double benefit out of this uh, because she can on player face stand next to a unit who then attacks and takes almost no counterattack, and then she can fly over to guard another unit, both on player and enemy face. So if you use Marina wisely, you can trivialize certain chapters. And that is, in my opinion, what warrants a five-star rating. Even though she joins pretty late, her utility is just through the roof because she can just make units survive things that they just wouldn't survive otherwise, which is fantastic. And because she has reliable two range, when you place her in like a four square formation with four units around her and Marina in the center, uh, you can put her in such a place that she will be able to retaliate against anything that attacks her while also guarding the units around her, which is just such a good combination. I love this unit. Easily one of the best support units in the ROM. Maybe, like, aside from units like Schumanner, of course, who joins much earlier. Her late join time is her only issue. In the Cherry Rod, she will join in Chapter 16 instead. And then it's time for the boss review of the ghost ship. Uh, there is a boss in this chapter, in fact. It's just normally you don't notice because it's just a generic entombed, I think. But this is Grits, and oh boy, Grit is pretty scary if you're not prepared for him. If you've already cleared the ghost ship by the time he shows up, uh, you'll just kill him. But if you don't, he will start killing units. He's very scary. He can kill Marina extremely easily because this guy comes with an iron ballista. Look at the range of this thing. Like... Grit is your punishment for playing this map defensively. You need to advance onto the ship and wipe out these enemies, unless you want to just get murdered by an Iron Ballista. He has an Iron Bray Bow, but I've personally never seen him use it, because he'll just default to the Ballista whenever he can. He drops a Feel Shield, which is fantastic. You want Marina to get this as soon as possible, because there are Bonewalkers with bows on this map, and she really wants that. Also remember to steal his Gemstone, very important, 20,000 gold. That's a lot of money. So, um, he has Dead Eye, which means he'll never miss, and uh, if you're unlucky, he'll put you to sleep, and he also has extra crit. So, uh, this boss, it's very difficult for me to raid him, because if you haven't cleared the ship uh, he arrives at when he shows up, it's probably GG. If you have cleared the ship, you kill him very easily, because the Iron Ballista weighs 20. So it pretty much negates all of his speeds, to the point where anyone can kill him. So he's like a 1-star unit if, you, if you've if you cleared the ship, and he's like a 5-star unit if you haven't. So I think I'm just going to go between the middle of the two and rate him 3 stars. Because whether or not he'll be scary or not depends entirely on how you play the chapter up until the point that he appears at. I think he, yeah, he shows up on turn 7, so you have plenty of time to clear out the ship. If you haven't, you only have yourself to thank, I guess. He'll definitely kill Morina and Sig grid uh, if you don't kill him the turn he shows up so yeah scary boss next up we have chapter 12 and here you get a lot of new units but most of them we've talked about before you get jen in this chapter she's a little higher level than in uh, cherry's route but that's because she joins later so here you can see she has capped skill for example you also get Ganondorf in this house, and you can also recruit Professor Hero over here, but you obviously don't want to do that because this unit sucks. So you only really get one new unit in this chapter, and not counting the chair out, and that is Isa, or Isa. Isa is fantastic. One of the best units in the ROM. I don't say that jokingly. Uh, you may not think so. You may look at this unit and you're like, what, really? An Erika Lord is the best unit in the ROM? Why is this unit so good? Well, I mean, first of all, she does have respectable stats. 13 strength, 16 speed is pretty good for an unpromoted unit at this stage during the game. Uh, she has decent growth rates in all areas, except for defense and resistance, but she doesn't really need it. She'll cap out speed and lock and become a dodge tank anyway. Uh, she's locked to swords eternally, but this doesn't really matter. Because, you see, Ista has two of the funniest skills in the game. 
Nihil, which, again, any unit with Nihil on it is going to be so insanely useful. Again, there are monkeys in the late game, uh, there, there's bosses which will straight up kill you with certain skill combinations. Nihil just bypasses all of the BS you have to deal with, so instantly just makes any unit that has it fantastic. But Issa also has plot armor, which is fantastic, because uh, not only does it make her immune to her own personal weapons, Devil Effect, which this is a sword with the Devil Effect, which is why it has stats through the roof. Uh, this is like, this would normally hurt her, but because she doesn't care about it, she just uses it as a really strong sword, which is a genius planning, by the way. I love to see people use their personal weapon in conjunction with their, their build to make it even better. But this skill is also hilarious because enemies in the game have a very low luck. Like, if you take a look at the, the generic enemies, 5 luck, 4 luck, 4 luck, 3 luck, enemies usually have luck in the single digits, um, which means that they're very likely to proc this skill. They're gonna have between a 25 to 30% chance to just hurt themselves and do zero damage to Issa. So this is like Pavais slash Aegis on crack, because not only will it negate the damage done to her, but it'll hurt the enemies as well. This is an absolutely bonkers skill. Uh, it saved her lives so many times, I can't even count the amount of times that she dodged a lethal blow because of plot armor. Uh, and it, it just... It procs all the time, and it hurts the enemies and prevents Issa from taking damage. I mean, I don't understand why anyone would want Pavice or Aegis when you can get this skill. It has a higher activation rate, and it essentially does the same thing, but better. It negates damage dealt to Issa, and instead deals them back at, at, at the unit, which is just insane. Like, I don't know what we were thinking pricing the skill as lowly as we did. And in co combination with her insanely good uh, personal weapon, Arendite, nice Witcher reference, by the way, I appreciate that. Uh, this just ends up being one of the best units in the ROM. I, I, I don't say that ironically. Uh, she is a five-star unit. Uh, train Issa and you will be so insanely thankful because she has the offense to go up against some of the scarier enemies in the late game. And uh, because of her plot armor, she'll just negate damage and deal tons of damage back to the enemy. And because of her Nihil, she can kill monkeys, she can kill bosses. Uh, train this unit and she will be one of the best units you have in your army. Absolutely, uh, there's there's no debate about this. Sure, her promotion isn't great, she promotes the Great Lord, but I think you can also make her a Paladin if you want to give her 1-2 range. But I personally just stuck with the Great Lord because I think it looks cooler, and because her offense was so damn good anyway. I used her as the boss killer, she was like my main boss killer, and this is, this is a unit you definitely want to train. She's funny to use as hell, she's exciting to use, and she bypasses BS. Just a terrific unit all over. And then we come to the boss of this chapter, Weber the Elder Bale. <laughs> Looks funny, I like this boss a lot, he's funny. He's not very good though, he's not very scary at all. He will move, so be careful. Um, if you come within his range, he will slap you, quite literally. Uh, and if he does, his damage is actually pretty insane. 43 damage and 148 hits, so if you let him hit you, he'll hurt. He'll hurt badly. Um, you can't double him because he has Wary Fighter, and he might petrify you, and he will proc it often with Rightful Lord. But in my opinion, you should never let Weber hit you. He's an Elder Bale, so what you do is you just kill him with you kill him from a distance. Sure, he has capped rest, but it still isn't hard at this point to burn through this unit. I mean, 18 defense, 22 rest, 67 HP. It sounds terrifying at this point, but you have so many units which should just be able to burn through this no problem at all. Uh, you can take your time and not pull him until you're ready because he just stands there. He, he goes into your range if you go, if you go close to him. But the thing is, his offense isn't so scary that you can't tank it. 43 damage is a lot, but you have plenty of tanks which should be able to take one hit from him just fine. He can't double, keep this in mind, so you'll only ever take one hit. Uh, sure, he might petrify you, but you just save him for the last, and then you just pull him with a strong unit and you just murder him from, from a distance, and it shouldn't be hard at all. Two out of five stars. Uh, unless you have, like, a very weak roster, I, I don't really see this boss being posing much of a challenge to you at all. And then we move over to chapter 13 of Farton's Route, and you do get a lot of new units in this chapter, uh, but we've talked about, I think, everyone before. Yeah, you get Garibon, but we talked about him. You get Mercy, we've talked about her as well. Uh, you get Okasha in this chapter, but we've talked about him as well. So I think that pretty much just only leaves the boss. I might be wrong here, but I really don't think there's any new units of note to talk about here. So let's review the boss then, I guess. Sharty, uh, the Great Knight, the brother of Marty. And uh, his stats are pretty high because he's based on Selena. And he has Aether, which is a little scary if he procs it, as well as Devil's Luck. So uh, he will give his own Devil Reversal to the enemy. But luckily his luck is 13, so it's not as high as that of Marty in some of the chapters uh, prior to this. 
and he has a Devil Axe equipped. This is actually a detriment to him because uh, the fact that he doesn't have a ranged weapon means that you can just blast him down from two range. Sure, he might backfire on you, but at this point you have several Nihil units capable of dealing with this. Uh, Issa will tear him a new one if you trained her, for example. She'll just murder him and there's very little he can do against her. And unlike his brother, Shardy doesn't have uh, extra... He doesn't have the hit rate. So um, he'll... He, he, you can dodge him pretty reliably with a strong sword unit, for example. Be careful, though. He has a sword weaver. So, uh, but if you just pull him in with the devil axe, it's not very hard to kill him at all. I found this to be one of the easier bosses in the game. So I'm going to rate him 2 out of 5 stars. He can maybe take you a little bit off guard. And his 3 leadership stars also are a little bit annoying. He buffs all the enemies on this map by 3%. But overall, I didn't find Shardy to be a very scary boss. His lack of a ranged weapon makes him kind of a joke. And then we come to chapter 14, which PH decided to completely transform into something which doesn't even resemble the original chapter. He took the Vigard boss and let chat submit a green unit. So the boss of this chapter isn't a boss, it's a green unit we have to keep alive. And this ended up being Louise the Adventure. Uh, I guess I should rate her on how good she is. I mean, she's fantastic. Five star, because she's Louise. But... Uh, she also has an Iron Ballista, a little bit of cheating, I did say that Siege Tumps weren't allowed, but I didn't specifically say the Ballistas were not allowed, so people were like, haha, we can give her a Ballista. But this is good, because this chapter is hell, because this chapter is basically PH being an absolute ass and doing everything he can to kill you. Uh, so the fact that we had a green unit with a Ballista to help us out here is completely fine. She will also heal with her Physics Staff, which is nice too. If she dies, uh, you will get a game over, but I, I think it's pretty easy to keep her alive. Uh, the boss of this chapter is like a PH self-insert, so I'm not even gonna bother reviewing it. It's just Geb, so who, who gives a shit? But yeah, no new characters in this chapter aside from Issa, but I've talked about Issa already. So uh, yeah, not there's no need to talk about her again. Uh, this chapter is pretty fun though, you know, despite the fact that PH is an asshole, I, 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 I found this chapter pretty enjoyable. So, but yeah, just don't let, let Louise die. Spoiler alert, he spawns assassins on the last turn, so be a little bit careful about that. You don't want them to rush in and, and kill her. That, that would be a very bad way to end this chapter, I think. And then we come to chapter 15, and I don't think there's any new playable units to talk about here, because all of them we've talked about before. This is where you get Scutum, as well as Jack Garland, and an auto-level Cherry, if you didn't train her yet. And, uh, yeah, I don't think there's a single new playable character which we haven't talked about before, so I'll just go ahead and review the two bosses. Starting with the Volta replacement, Tanya, the Malignant Knight. And uh, Tanya, she does move, by the way, so be careful, but I didn't find her to be particularly scary. She has the Excalibur Tome, which seems scary on paper, uh, and she has the Constitution to wield it too, so be a little bit cautious about that. But at this point, you really shouldn't struggle with this unit. Her stats are actually kind of mediocre. I thought they'd be much higher than this. Um, but she does have some skills which makes her harder to deal with an enemy face. But what you want to do is you don't want to attack her on her enemy face. Uh, so basically, this is like when you attack her on player face, she gets stronger. But what you do, since she moves, you just put a strong unit here, like an archer, and then you pull her from this distance, and then you can very easily kill her on the retaliation. Like, for example, Ukasha, just give her, give him a barrier boost, and with a silver bow, he should be able to, like, bring her down to 10 health and debuff her. As long as he doesn't get doubled by Excalibur, this should be no problem at all. And as I said, you just have so many ways of dealing with Tanya at this point. You have Marina, which gives 8 defense and rest. Just place her behind an archer, pull pull Tanya in, and kill her on the on, on enemy face. It's super easy. Uh, it's I'm not going to say she's, like, completely a trivial boss to deal with or anything. But I think I'm going to rate her 3 out of 5 stars. But I just didn't find that at this point, this was a hard boss to deal with. You just have so many resources and tools at your disposal to counter this now, so it's not really a big deal. But then we come to the other boss of this chapter, and he is much, much more difficult to deal with. Sweden the Necromancer. This guy has a very trolley build. He nearly has capped magic and the double lion skill, so he, all of his weapons will be brave tomes. And he comes with a Nagalfar. A little bit of a cheat, maybe I shouldn't allow this, but it is theoretically an S-rank weapon that he can use, so why not? So what does this mean? He'll hit you for 50 plus damage twice before you can do anything to him. If you attack him first, you better be able to survive 50 damage twice. Nagalfar has really good stats. It has a lot of weight, so his avoid sucks, but that doesn't really bother him because he'll kill you anyway. So this is just a really hard unit to deal with. Like, even with a barrier boost, there are very few units who can survive 53 damage twice to the face. How I ended up dealing with it was um, he does move. 
and this is good because it means you can pull him off his fort. I think if you weren't able to do that, it'd be very, very hard to deal with him. But what you do, or what I did, was I just used all my support units and I stacked damage reduction on like my tankiest unit. I think I used Groroth. And what I did was I put Marina next to him and I put a bunch of other like damage reducing skills uh, and stacked them up to the extreme. And then I placed Goroth in range, and he was just barely able to take two Nagalfars to the face. And at that point, if you can have a unit survive and retaliate back, then Sweden will most likely die on the next turn. But if you don't have a strong tanky unit, and if you don't have Marina, I can very easily see Sweden just killing one of your units. I don't think there are many units in the realm that can tank this level of damage. So a very, very scary boss for sure. I'm glad he doesn't have any staves. I could have very easily given him some annoying status staves, but I guess he wanted to give him the Nagalfars, so that works. This is fine. But yeah, a very scary boss. Five out of five stars easily. I think he's definitely one of the trickiest bosses in the entire ROM. And then we move over to chapter 16, and here we get two new units, one of them being one of the best late game pre-promotes in the game in Claire. She rejoins you here as a level 13 bishop. I don't think giving her an experience in 5x really does much, because I think it's a separate unit. I think what PH did here was he just took boss Orson, made him into a bishop, and had him join the party. So here we have Claire with boss Orson stats, which is ridiculous. I mean, this unit is not only good because of her insane stats. I mean, just look at this. 23 magic, 22 speed. This is one of the best combat late game pre-promotes that you get in the entire ROM. But she's 17 defense and 19 resistance. I mean, this unit is just the perfect combat unit. The only thing she has that is a problem is her low skill. But this doesn't really matter because light magic is super accurate anyway. Uh, growth rates are, are solid. Again, skill is very low, but it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, magic is going to get capped, speed is going to get capped for sure, and she also has solid HP, defense, and resistance. Just overall, incredible unit. Khan is a little low, she will get slowed down by like Shine and Artoms, but just give her a Lightning Tom, she'll kill everything, it doesn't really matter. Uh, and she has Charisma, which is a fantastic uh, support skill, buffs all nearby allies within 3 tiles with 10% hidden avoid, this is fantastic. Like, Claire is not only a great combat unit, but she also buffs her allies, and she has 5 leadership stars. So, 5% hit and avoid to the entire army when fielded. I mean, it doesn't get much better than this. This is just a bonkers unit, 5 out of 5 stars. It doesn't matter that she joins in Chapter 16. When she joins, she will probably be one of your strongest units, both combat-wise and support-wise. Uh, I don't think PH intended for this unit to be as strong as she is, uh, but it's just bonkers. Ah, oh, I, by the way, I didn't mention Slayer, so whenever you go up against monsters, her tomes deal effective damage. So, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it was, if it wasn't for the fact that she joined so late, I'd say she's pro she would probably be a better unit than Schumanner. Um, if it wasn't for Schumanner's insane summoning utility and the fact that he joins in Chapter 1. Uh, but yeah, despite joining this late, she's still one of the best units in the realm. Absolutely crazy. You also get a bunch of Berserk staves if you recruit her early, but be a little bit cautious about this, uh, because uh, you don't want to rush into this chapter, it's very hard. But yeah, get that Divine Tome off her, she loses 6 points of speed from it. Just give her... she give her a Lightning Tome. She can kill everything with a Lightning Tome. Just make sure she can double, and her high magic will just mean that she kills everything. So yeah, absolutely insane unit. This is also where you get a Lathe. None of you guys have seen this unit yet, uh, unless you played the recent version of the ROM. Uh, we decided to put a Lathe in here. This is the final Patreon unit that was added to the ROM. And a Lathe is just a cookie cutter pre-promote Sage. I mean, solid base stats all around, 20 magic, 21 skill, 19 speed. She's a bit of a pent, I guess you could say. She's very similar to how pent works. Just a very solid uh, late to mid game pre-promote. She has, uh, which I definitely need to censor out, otherwise I'm gonna get demonetized and she has Imbue, so uh, she has a skill percentage chance to just ignore rest, which, eh, that's okay, it's not fantastic, but it's decent, she'll deal a little bit of extra damage every now and then. She also has a personal tome in the Incentaurus, which is just a strong Elfire tome, I believe. Looking at it, 10 might, 9 to hit, 15 crit, no, it doesn't slow her down, it's a solid tome. Ton, ton, tons of uses too, so it won't break as easily, and she can use Physic at base. So this is just a solid unit, 4 out of 5 stars, uh, she can fight, she can heal, um, she has decent skills. Yeah, just a solid late game sage. She has many levels to grow too, and uh, very high magic growth, so she'll definitely cap her magic. Yeah, she's basically pent. She's FE7 pent. She kills stuff, she heals, she's solid, requires very little investment to be good. Uh, you can definitely feel there if you need an extra sage on your team. 
Then we have the boss of this chapter, Foybucker. I didn't realize what I put into the ROM until I read it out loud. Thanks a lot, chat. I appreciate it. Uh, Foybucker is a general, and he looks scary. Like, when you look at his stats, you're like, oh boy, 27 strength, 21 skill, 52, oh, oh, 26 defense. So scary. Uh, but then you realize that uh, his great shield, which is kind of annoying, can just be trivialized by a Nihil user. If you don't have a Nihil user like Issa with an Armor Slayer, you're going to struggle against this guy. So it's difficult for me to raid him, because you definitely don't want to fight him. He has Aether, and he has a Tomahawk, so if you punks this, you're probably dead. So if you lost all of your Nihil users at this point, then Foybucker can give you a lot of trouble. If you have a Nihil user, you can just put an Armor Slayer or a Hammer on and just murder this guy. Uh, so it's kind of hard for me to raid him, because without Nihil, he's like four or five stars maybe, but with Nihil, he's like one star. So I think, again, I'm just once again just going to go for the middle rating and just give him three stars. It's kind of difficult to raid a boss like this, because he can be so wildly different depending on what units you've trained. But if you've had the brains to train in a hill unit, you can just completely trivialize this guy. He's not really scary outside of his procs. And then we move into chapter 17. And at this point, we're starting to reach the end of the game, and there's not that many playable units left. But you do get the Cyrene replacement, Uriel. Ur your Ariel? Ariel? Uriel? I, I, why did you give her such a name? I can't pronounce it for the life of me. Uh, she's a Harrier, which is pretty nice. She's a flying magic unit that can also use spares. So kind of like a Malignite, except she gets spares instead of axes, I guess. And uh, Uriel is a very serviceable pre-promote. I mean, her stats are decent. They're not great for this level. They're not great for this stage of the game, but they're not terrible either. I mean, 16 strength, 17 magic, 20 speed. That is that is decent. You do need to be careful because she will get slowed down heavily by her starting equipment, so you might want to give her some uh, different ones unless you want her to be doubled, because this map is pretty hard. But Uriel has some decent skills. She has Petrify, which is always nice. Uh, I think it's better on a solid enemy face unit, but it works on a player face unit as well. Rightful God, so she procs it very frequently. 48% chance to proc it at base. And she also has a Bane, which... Uh, I'm not a big fan of this, if I'm going to be completely honest. Um, I think the idea was to have a unit that sets up kills for other units, but you don't really need that at this point. What you need is just a solid pre promote. And Uriel isn't bad by any means. She's just not very spectacular either. Sure, when her Petrify procs, it's nice, but at this point, you need more than just a single Petrify proc. And she doesn't really have an enemy face to speak of, so it's scary to leave her in range of multiple enemies, so you won't really get a chance to, like, Petrify multiple enemies like Jack Garland can. Since she's a flyer, she can't, like, take refuge in a forest or a fort and, like, face, like, four or five enemies on enemy face. She can't do that. She's a flyer. And even though she comes with a Feely Shield, which protects her from arrows, she I find that she will still just die to enemies, because the Nosferatu slows her down by, what, seven, six points? Yeah, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 13, 14. Yeah, 6 points. So it basically puts her speed down to 14, which means she will be doubled. If you take a look at some of the enemies in this chapter, uh, you can see that, well, actually, yes, yeah, mostly... Uh, yeah, Swordmasters will double her. There's a chance that... Yeah, maybe some of the Vyvern Lords will get close to doubling. You gotta be careful. That's all I'm saying. But 3 out of 5 stars for Uriel. She's alright. She's not great. But she's alright. She's She's decent. The boss of this chapter is PH. I'm not going to rate this piece of shit. This is just like PH being PH. Uh, zero stars out of 40. All right, so the boss of this chapter is PH. Uh, if you kill him, the map ends. I'm not going to rate him, obviously, because he made himself. Uh, but there is a second boss uh, in this chapter named Sam Weiss. He's a warrior, and he's not particularly challenging. I'd say the most thing he contributes is the three leadership stars he comes with. Uh, he has pretty mediocre skills, Rightful Lord, Black Magic, and Intimidate, so yeah, not really super scary. Only has a Killer Axe and a Hand Axe for defense. You can kill him for some stat boosters if you want. Uh, but I don't think this is a particularly scary unit. His stats aren't that great. Hand Axes are pretty bad. So, 2 out of 5 stars. You don't really need to kill him. Nothing happens if you do. Again, he's just there if you want some stat boosters. That's pretty much about it. And then we go into chapter 18, and here you get a really strong late game pre-promote in Atlas the Huntsmen. I don't know why they're not called Huntsmen. Huntsmen? Are we gender neutral now, Fire Emblem? Um, Atlas is insanely good. I mean, just look at those bases. 22 strength. That's really solid. And it comes with the coveted double lion skill, which means that all of his weapons will be brave. And he comes with very solid weapons ranks as well. A rank in Axis, A rank in Bows. Can use silver axe and silver bows right off the bat. 
He's a little slow. 15 speed is not enough to double reliably at this point during the game. He will be lucky to not be doubled by certain enemies. Thing is though, he has 65% speed. So if you give him a couple of levels, his speed will start to grow. And if you can like save a speed ring or two for him, I would actually recommend giving it to him because having a unit that can quad is insanely good. Um, and his 22 base strength is also ridiculous. Like his damage output is fantastic. He's not insanely good. I'm also gonna rate him three out of five stars. He's just a very serviceable pre-promote, uh, but he does need some investment to get going. He's not he's not excellent right off the bat because he just he usually just hits twice thanks to his double line. He doesn't quad, but if you can get him up to a level where he can reliably quad, he can become very very powerful. And then we have the boss of this chapter, Vel, and this was a massive troll. I can't believe I didn't see this coming when I selected her. <laughs> so you may look at this boss and you're like, huh? A boss that only heals? What's up with this? And power staff? What's going on here? Three speed? Four luck? 30 magic? 27? What? What's going on here? Until you realize she's gonna heal every single egg on the map. So this is exactly what happens. She moves over, she procs her fortify, and pretty much heals every single egg on the map to full. Which means that a bunch of Gorgons will spawn when the eggs do begin to hatch. And she also does it again. So I can't do anything but rate this boss 5 out of 5 stars because this is such a genius concept and such a hilarious way to build a boss. I mean, sure, on its own this boss wouldn't be scary, but when in conjunction with this map it becomes super scary. Because normally this chapter is like free egg farm, I mean you just kill eggs to get a bunch of experience, it's super easy to reach them before they hatch. But with this boss here, suddenly it becomes a lot harder. So this boss not only makes the map much harder, but it's also just hilarious. So, I, props to whoever made this boss, this is such a, a cool concept, and it just ended up changing the whole map. I think, if it wasn't for Vel, this chapter would be fairly trivial, but because Vel is here, this map turns into an absolute nightmare, and that is nothing but good boss design. Or awful design, depending on how you look at it. I personally thought it was hilarious. And then we come into chapter 19, and uh, in this chapter you only get one new playable unit, but all these green units right here, if they survive the battle, you can actually recruit one of them at the end. So I kind of have to go through all of them now, don't I? Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on each one, but I, I at least want to show off their growth rates and whatnot. Um, you only get to use them for like two chapters, so it's not really a big decision, but uh, I mean, you still probably want to select the best one you can, right? But there is a unit that everyone gets, and that is Bone Chill the Necromancer. And he's a very, very funny unit. He's the second summoner unit that you get after Schumanner. And his stats are pretty good. They're not great for this stage of the game. Like, 26 magic is pretty good, don't get me wrong. But 14 speed means he's gonna get doubled. He's very slow, and the Nosferatu also slows him down. So uh, be very careful with this guy. He will be doubled in this chapter. Uh, and 39 HP is not fantastic, so he's extremely frail. Yeah, you could say he's... It's almost as if he's made of bones, right? So, uh, but he does have plot armor, which we went over this before. This is a fantastic skill. It's basically just an amped up Aegis and Povice. So whenever he gets attacked, he'll just negate the damage and deal damage to his op opponent, which is fantastic. And he has black magic. I never really saw this do much. It, whenever it procs, he, he either berserks, silences, poisons, or sleeps his enemy. It's not great. Uh, seal luck, it's the worst seal skill by far, but it's still nice that he has it if he wants to debuff his opponents a little bit. But really, Bone Chill's main utility lies in the fact that he can use staves and the fact that he can summon units. Now, he summons children, which is kind of interesting. Uh, he summons green children, who also have plot armor, by the way. So they have a chance of backfiring and killing other units. Um, weird summon? Uh, they, they distract enemies, so that's nice. And they have a chance of backfiring on them, which is also nice. They're not as good as the a Schumann, but they're like, he's, he's like Discount Schumanner. And the thing is, the Discount Schumanner is still really good. So I still rate him 4 out of 5 stars, because the ability to summon green units and just provide staff utility is fantastic. I mean, it's like, even if even if it's like, Mom, can we have Schumanner? No, we have Schumanner at home. Schumanner at home. I, I still take Schumanner at home, because Schumanner at home is still Schumanner. And that's a fantastic unit, so... Yeah, he has some problems, and he joins super late. But you're still gonna be very happy to have this guy in the late game. Trust me, those children can really save you from some sticky situations. I probably shouldn't have said that. That's gonna get taken out of context. But yeah, just use Bone Chill, he's great. Now, before we get to the green units, I'm gonna review the boss of this chapter, Smithereens. Uh, he's a death goyle. 
and he's pretty scary. He has recklessness, so he's very fast, 29 speed. He also has vantage, and he comes with two spares and some curse boots. Um, you want to be a bit cautious about this guy. He'll definitely double a lot of your units because he has the con to wield the spare. And with 29 speed, like, most of your units will be doubled. So just make sure you can take the hit. Uh, if you can, he's pretty easy to kill because he's a flyer. So just shoot him down with a bow. Like, a silver bow will absolutely wreck him. Uh, but he can, can jump you from out of the fog and kill some of your units. So be a little bit cautious with this guy. Uh, I rate him 4 out of 5 stars in terms of difficulty. Uh, he definitely killed one of my units, I think, on, my, on some of my attempts. So scary boss. But uh, if you can survive his initial attack, he'll usually die on the next turn. So not super scary, but scary enough to the point where I, I don't think he's uh, worth like a three star rating. I think four star is fair for him because he is very deadly. All right, so let's uh, go over each of the green units that you can recruit. The first one is Norian Girl, the Ambulance. And uh, Norian Girl is extremely tanky. Uh, her growth rates look like this. Uh, it doesn't really matter that much. I don't think she's going to get much experience at this stage during the game. Uh, but ambulances are nice. Um, they can heal and they can attack with lances. Her guard lance is the same as Issos. I uh, don't think that description quite uh, is correct. I think I just copied it over from the guard lance. I think that's why it says Issa only. That's not the case. Only Norin girl can use this. It just gives her five defenses if she really needed this. Uh, she has fortune, so she can't be crit, and bracing stance, which gives her plus four defense and resistance. This is a very, very solid late game green unit. I'd say if you need a solid staff user, she's probably your best bet. Uh, I'll rate her 3 out of 5 stars. I can't really rate her any higher because she joins so late. Uh, but in terms of, like, how useful she is for the late game, I'd say she's pretty damn useful. I mean, this is a unit that won't die. Uh, 14 speed means she will be doubled, but she normally has the sort of ability to deal with it. Uh, her offense will never really be that great since she won't double naturally. But uh, if you pick her, you just want a solid staff unit, you're definitely not going to regret picking her. She's, she's, a, she's a very good choice. Then we have Nisam, the warrior, and uh, he is a fantastic choice. I'd say, out of all the green units, I'd say he's probably the best one. Uh, his stats are really high, 25 strength, 25 skill. He's a fantastic combat unit. He's really useful for this point during the game. He has the Bayraban, which is a battle axe that is good against magic units. It's a little low in hits, but that is fine because Nisam has Tomb Breaker. So he gets 550 hit and avoid whenever he's up against the magic unit. So that will usually help him land hits. And 13 Might is pretty good. That triples in effectiveness against magic units. And yes, this works against PH, by the way. It is super effective against PH because he's considered a magic unit. So a very strong axe to use against some of the late game magic users. will probably one-shot them, to be honest. And he also has A-rank in uh, axes and bows. So you can also give him some strong bows. And five leadership stars. What's not to love? This is probably my favorite pick among the green units. Uh, four out of five stars, this is as good as a late game pre-promote gets. Uh, he can definitely help you out in the late game by killing some scary mages. And yeah, his growth rates are solid too. Very good strength, very good speed, very good HP. Tanky as well, 50% defense and resistance. All around just a very solid choice for the late game. Uh, I would definitely pick this guy, you won't be disappointed. Up next, we have Pastrami, the Halberdier, and I think her stats are probably the most mediocre out of the green units, maybe with the exception of the Swordmaster. I don't think they're very good. Uh, 21 strength, 18 speed. It sounds good, but for this stage during the game, it's not that great. I think she's going to struggle to reliably double. And her stats are just, like, kind of mediocre in most areas. And her growth rates are balanced in most areas. But at this point, she's level 12. She's not going to get that much more experience. So... Don't really expect her to grow that much beyond her starting point. She has an interesting combination of skills. She has Astra, Rightful Lord, and Bane. Now, I have no idea how these two interact. I haven't tested this. But I think the concept of Astra and Bane is that she procs Astra, and then she might proc Bane during her Astra, which will leave her opponent at 1 HP and then kill her on the next attack. I think that's the idea behind the skill. I don't know how good it is. I've never used Pastrami. If this works the way I think it does, then she might be pretty decent because she can just like straight up kill bosses with this. Uh, it would be nice if someone could let me know. I'm actually very unsure what to rate her because I just don't know whether or not this combination works. If it works, I would probably rate her four stars because I think that she might just be able to kill certain bosses with this, with this kind of cheesy combo. If it doesn't work, she's a two star unit. So maybe I'll just settle on three stars since I'm not sure, but I'm gonna leave this one up slightly to uh, I'm just gonna let you guys correct me because again it's I just I've never tried this unit before I don't know if this combination works based on how the skills are coded but 
Overall, she's not fantastic. She has a personal weapon, it's just a javelin with improved stats. It's alright for this stage of the game, but I think a spare works better. And then we have Jobot the War Monk, and uh, I don't really see the point in picking this guy, uh, because uh, what's the point? I mean, you can pick Norian Girl, she's a much better healer. Uh, he's kind of tanky though, he has a guard axe, which again, sorry, it copies is a spear. Uh, it's just an axe which gives him plus 5 defense. He does have decent stats, I'll give him that. His growth rate is kind of weird, he has 100% defense on HP, which is kind of nice, but again, he won't grow much at this point. Uh, he has live to serve, so he heals himself, and he also has some debuffs. I mean, I can see this maybe being a little bit useful against some bosses in the late game. So take back what I said, actually, There's these two skills can actually be worth something against some of the bosses, so I think for that reason I'll rate him 3 stars. He's a viable support unit. Uh, he can heal, he can use axes, and he can debuff enemies. It's kind of nice. And up next we have 2B, the Swordmaster, and uh, yeah, this one is not very good in my opinion. Um, I don't like this unit. Um, like, this is like the Karla of the ROM. 19 strength is kind of bad at this point. Sure, she'll double. But um, yeah, what, 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 you don't need a you don't need a unit like this at this stage. Um, the only like slightly viable thing about her is that she has a nihil blade, which is a Wu Dao, which grants her the nihil skill. So if you don't have any nihil users at this point, I would I would get her just for the sword, because you need nihil users in the late game. If you have nihil users, I don't really see the point in picking her. Um, I, I still can't rate her anything below three stars just because she has nihil. And that is a very viable skill. But if you already have multiple nail users, you don't need this unit. But pick her if you don't have them. That's yeah, that's pretty much all I say about this unit. She's pretty bad otherwise. Like 10 defense is laughable at this stage. She's gonna get killed. But uh use her if you need to, I guess. And the final green unit you can obtain is Wangs. Uh, <laughs> And Wangs, out of all the green units that can recruit, he's probably the worst, in my opinion. He is terrible. 3 skill, 12 speed. It doesn't matter that he has capped strength and luck and high defense. He won't hit anything and he won't kill anything. Sure, plot armor is a fun skill. I've talked about how funny it is. But it's it doesn't redeem this unit. I mean, Miracle doesn't matter because, I mean, when, when is he ever going to get one shot below half health? I mean, maybe against very scary units. But he has so much defense and resistance, this pretty much won't proc. He has a Devil Sword, which, uh, you know, it's good. 18 might, 95 hit. But it needs more hit on it, in my opinion, to warrant Wang's actually hitting anything. With 3 skill, it's not going to hit shit. So, it, as a combat unit, he's very unimpressive. He's a one-star unit. I mean, he's got a cool portrait, I'll give him that. But out of all the units, all the green units, I'd say he's the worst, by far. Pick him for memes, I guess, if you think he's funny, but don't expect him to do anything. Alright, so here we are in the uh, penultimate chapter. We only have a single playable unit that joins at this stage, and it is Shirtless Tana. And I'm gonna be completely honest, this unit blows. Uh, it's fun because it's Shirtless Tana, but she's really bad. As far as, like, an Athos goes, it's probably one of the least impressive ones I've seen. Sure, 28 strength, nice. 25 skill, 32 speed. I mean, she's a good combat unit. Just get these devil weapons away from her, they're gonna get her killed. Because she has tree luck. Like, I don't know if the creator intended for her to have all these devil weapons. I think this is something chat decided to do. But, um, she sucks. <laughs> I mean, she... I mean, sure, she can fight a little bit, which is nice. She has advantage, keep up, and dragon blood is a really weird set of skills, in my opinion. Tree leadership stars is nice, though. Uh, but yeah, two out of five stars. I... This unit is very unspectacular. She won't really carry you at all. Uh, she might be able to lend a little bit of uh, assistance in fighting. But uh, I, I feel like the Goto could have been a lot more exciting than this. This is just kind of like a Berserker that's not very good at, at its job. Um, but, you know, it's shirtless Tana, I guess. So, she's funny for memes, haha. The boss of this chapter is once again PH, which is just PH. I'm not gonna rate him. Uh, I hope you have Nihil units, that's all I'm gonna say. So, yeah. And in the final chapter, it's basically just a gauntlet of bosses that will charge you from all sides. You'll fight every single boss in the ROM so far, including some unique ones at the end. But I'm not gonna go over them, you'll have to figure out who they are for yourself. Uh, they weren't really created by the players, so I don't really see the point in raiding them. Uh, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, 
that pretty much concludes it, I think. I've gone through the ROM and I've rated every single playable character and every single boss with a star rating. Do you agree with my rating or do you disagree with my rating? Let me hear in the comment section below. It doesn't count if you're actually the one who made the unit because you're gonna be biased. But I mean, I know you're gonna yell at me anyway. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, this ROM is available. Uh, just click the link in the video description or get the UPS patch if you don't have Discord. And let me know if you're enjoying this uh, ROM so far. I feel a little bit bad that we had to rush it due to Engage, but uh, it is out and you can play it. And uh, I think PH and DS Noon might add some updates to it at a later date. They said they would at any rate, but they're both busy working on but on Saga, so I don't know when this is going to be. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching. My name is Manx. Let me know what you thought in the comment section below, and I shall see you guys next time. Bye-bye.